Oklahoma Democrat. We now bring you coverage of that subcommittee hearing, which will run about two hours, 20 minutes. Subcommittee will come to order. Today, the subcommittee will be taking a second look at the adequacy of the Environmental Protection Agency's program to regulate waste trade between the United States and foreign nations. As many of you all know, at a hearing held by this subcommittee three years ago, we learned some shocking information on the practices of many U.S. companies which exported hazardous waste to foreign nations for disposal. Many of these nations had neither the technical expertise nor the financial resources necessary to adequately manage or dispose of such waste. Reports of improper handling of U.S. waste in foreign countries and the odyssey of the U.S. ship, the Kean Sea, sailing from port to port to try to unload its cargo of municipal incinerator ash proved embarrassing for the United States and tarnished our international image as a country concerned about the safe disposal of hazardous and solid waste. The hearing also revealed that EPA's waste export program was simply not adequate. We learned that under the U.S. waste export laws, EPA must notify a foreign country of the U.S. company's intent to export hazardous waste and must obtain the receiving country's consent to receive the waste prior to allowing shipment. However, the United States will not prohibit waste exports if the receiving country has given its consent to the waste shipment, even if the U.S. officials are concerned about the adequacy of export uh, proposal. Furthermore, exports of so-called non-hazardous waste, such as a barge full of municipal incinerator ash, are left completely unregulated under current law. As we will hear today, the laws have not changed. The regulations have not changed. It is still EPA's position that the United States is under no obligation to inform receiving countries of export proposals which it believes are suspect. Since 1988, however, international attention on this issue has increased dramatically. Many developing and underdeveloped countries took aggressive steps to ban the importation of foreign waste for disposal. And in 1989, the United States participated in negotiating the Basel Convention on the Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste and Their Disposal, sponsored by the United Nations Environmental Program. The convention, which will enter into force once 20 countries have ratified it, requires exporting countries to ensure that hazardous waste they generate are managed and disposed in, quote, an environmentally sound manner, unquote. Several legislative proposals have been introduced to tighten regulatory controls on waste exports and to implement the requirements of the Basel Convention. We will be discussing the merits of those proposals, uh, those proposals a little bit later. Now, the focus of today's hearing will be the United States waste trade with its closest neighbors, Mexico and Canada. Currently, the United States sends about 85% of our hazardous waste exports to these two countries, with most waste destined for disposal going to Canada. Mexico officially did not accept hazardous waste for disposal. However, the United States does ship some hazardous waste to licensed Mexican facilities for recycling purposes. Now, the United States entered into a 1983 border environmental agreement with Mexico to address the disposal of hazardous waste generated by many U.S. companies called Maquiladoras, operating processing and assembly plants along the Mexican side of the border. These plants typically receive raw materials from the United States duty-free and after assembly return the products to the parent companies located in the United States. Now under this border environmental agreement, the United States is required to readmit for disposal all hazardous waste generated that uh, processes the U.S. materials. As representatives of the GAO will testify today, EPA does not have the data to be able to tell us even how many maquiladoras produce hazardous waste, let alone how much waste is generated by maquiladoras, or whether this waste is actually coming back to the United States for disposal. One thing is clear. Much of the waste that is supposed to be coming back to the United States for disposal is not. And if the waste is not being returned to the United States for disposal, it's probably being illegally dumped along the border. Undoubtedly, such illegal dumping of the hazardous waste will have significant adverse impacts on human health and the environment along both sides of the border. As we will see today, EPA needs to do more to ensure that the hazardous waste from the maquiladoras is returned. The U.S. has a moral obligation to the U.S. citizens located in cities and towns along the border 
and to Mexico to uphold its commitment to take back Maquiladora generated hazardous waste and to ensure that it is disposed of safely. Now, problems in tracking waste shipments between countries are not just limited to the United States waste trade with Mexico, however. Today we will examine a case involving a waste shipment from Canada and its voyage to find a final disposal des destination in the United States. As GAO will testify, its journey resembles a pinball game with disposal company after disposal company bumping the waste shipment all around the country. Why? Because the contents of the waste load did not match the description contained on the shipping documents. Three separate disposal companies rejected it on the basis of unacceptably high levels of contaminants, such as the banned pesticides of DDT, DDE, and chloridane. In addition, the shipping documents did not adequately identify the original generator of the waste or state that the waste was imported from Canada. Though these types of record-keeping problems may seem trivial, they could have potentially had serious consequences if an accident were to occur. Luckily, though, the pinball game did not hit tilt. Given the fact that there were few safeguards built into the system, however, I'm not so sure we'll be this lucky next time. I hope today's hearing will shed some light on the ways to address these problems, and I look forward to working with EPA to ensure that the United States does a better job in regulating its waste trade in the future. Mr. Klinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm pleased to join with you in this hearing today on the critical issues of regulation and disposal of waste with our neighboring countries of Canada and Mexico. I believe that our objectives on this issue are very much the same. We want to ensure that exported waste is disposed of in an environmentally sound manner and that human health and the environment are fully <coughs> protected. I hope that the hearing today will provide us with a greater understanding of the issue as we hear from both GAO and the EPA. In the last four years, we have seen tremendous growth of U.S. companies located across the border in Mexico known as maquiladoras. We don't know the volume of waste generated by these companies, how these wastes are being disposed of, and how much is being illegally dumped uh, in Mexico and not uh, returned to the U.S. for disposal. Before taking any further action, I think we need more data to fully evaluate the extent and scope of the problem. We should not overlook the positive steps that are already being taken in the United States and Mexico in this area. Both President Bush and Pre President Salinas acknowledge the need for increased environmental cooperation. Concurrent with the North, America, North American Free Trade Agreement, the U.S. and Mexico have developed a draft integrated environmental U.S.-Mexico border plan. This plan is now being revised after 16 public hearings were conducted along the border this fall. The plan calls for specific steps to be taken by both countries to correct environmental uh, deficiencies. In addition, I understand that the Mexican government will substantially increase the number of enforcement inspectors up to 200 along the border to ensure compliance with environmental laws. Finally, I would like to strongly endorse the urgent need for Congress to move quickly to ratify the Basel Convention and pass implementing legislation. The difficulty we face in controlling the import and export of waste is the lack of authority under current statute. It is important that we seek a balance, ensuring that there are necessary environmental protections, while at the same time respecting the sovereignty of other countries by not arbitrarily imposing our own standards. We also need to recognize the need for flexibility in dealing with our international partners at the negotiating table. My concern is that without passage of legislation, we risk being left out of the international negotiations as well as facing unnecessary disruptions in recycling markets. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. And now the member who probably is most affected on this subcommittee and also been one of the great leaders in this area, Albert Bustamante. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for bringing this issue before the subcommittee. Yes, when you talk about maquiladoras and when you talk about uh, concerns along the U.S.-Mexico border, we that represent that area and live in that area certainly are very, very concerned. My district now includes about 300 miles of U.S.-Mexico border, south of Laredo, all the way beyond Del Rio, Texas. The new district that has been redrawn um, under the new redistricting plans, my district will go from south of Laredo all the way to El Paso. That's 950 miles of U.S.-Mexico border on the Rio Grande that divides, um, of course, that separates Texas from Mexico. So we have hundreds or maybe a, a few thousand maquiladoras that 
operate on the Mexican side and, of course, the counterpart or some of the counterparts on the U.S. side. So when we talk about, about waste, toxic waste, chemical waste, and uh, we are truly concerned, and this has been one of the subjects of discussion with uh, Carla Hill as we talk about the new uh, free trade agreement. So I'm hopeful that our EPA people, said do it people from Mexico and of course the EPA of Canada will get together and put a plan that will protect all of us. Appreciate you calling this committee. Thank you, Mr. Bustamante. Our first panel this morning is Mr. Richard Hembra, uh, the Director of the Environmental Protection Issues of Resources Community and Environmental Development Division of our General Accounting Office. He will be accompanied this morning by Gerald Killian, Assistant Director, Mrs. Marcia McReef, Senior Evaluator, Mr. Houston Fuller, Assistant Director for Energy and Environmental Crimes, Office of Special right. Investigations. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome. As you know, it is the policy of this particular oversight subcommittee in order not to prejudice past or future witnesses that we swear all our witnesses in. Do any of you have any objection to being sworn in? None. If not, if you'd stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Hembra. Glad to have you. As you know the policy of the subcommittee, your entire uh, statement will be made part of the record, and at this time we look forward to your comments. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Klinger, Mr. Bustamante. Uh, let me uh, just take one moment, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, make you aware of what the players at the table have been involved in. Mr. Killian, to my immediate right, is my assistant director, and he manages uh, our work on hazardous and solid waste issues. To my left is Marcia McReith from our Dallas regional office, who directed our work on the Maquila Doors. And on my far right is Houston Fuller. Uh, I'd like to mention that our Office of Special Investigations has submitted a statement for the record on their work on the uh, uh, alleged uh, mixing of hazardous waste with fuels coming from Canada to the U.S. And uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fuller is available to answer any questions you might have on that specific issue. Uh, my remarks today will focus on efforts by the U.S. and Mexico to manage hazardous waste produced by the maquiladoras. As you know, such facilities can bring raw materials <coughs> into Mexico without paying import duties provided they export back to the originating country the finished products and related hazardous waste. The United States is a major source for materials used by the maquiladoras and a major market for their exported products and waste. Hazardous waste shipped to the United States from Mexico is processed through customs, and once it enters the United States, it's regulated like domestic hazardous waste under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. With that backdrop, let me begin by pointing out that the U.S. and Mexico laws and regulations provide similar frameworks for managing hazardous waste. However, CIDOE's 1991 Environmental Protection Budget of about $13 million pales in comparison with EPA's Hazardous Waste Budget of some $311 million. To Mexico's credit, it has taken steps to increase its environmental protection resources. In fact, the 1991 SIDUI budget is more than three times its 1990 budget. And if approved, a World Bank loan of more than $45 million with matching Mexican government funds would provide SIDUI with even more resources beginning in 1992. SIDUI, like EPA, has an inspection and enforcement system to detect environmental noncompliance. In fact, as an agency, SIDUI has more authority than EPA when it comes to forcing facilities back into compliance. For example, from January through August of 91, SIDUI performed 1,144 inspections and closed about 706 plants. Of those 1,144 inspections, 120 were at Maquila Doors, which resulted in 56 partial and temporary plant closings due to inadequate hazardous waste management practices. What I've just laid out suggests that Mexico has a legislative and regulatory framework for an effective hazardous waste program. And as additional resources become available, SIDUI should be in a position to more effectively control maquiladora hazardous waste in country. Unfortunately, and as Mr. Klinger pointed out, at this point in time, Mexico doesn't have a good handle 
on how many maquiladores are generating hazardous waste, the amount of hazardous waste they generate, and the final disposition of that waste. Without such information, SIDUI isn't able to effectively track hazardous waste in country or assist EPA in tracking the movement of maquiladora hazardous waste into the United States. For example, only 1,450 generators, including 446 maquiladoras, have registered with SIDUI. In addition, only about 300 of the estimated 1,000 maquiladoras that may generate hazardous waste are submitting manifests. SIDUI, through various efforts, is attempting to correct the uh, reporting noncompliance. Regardless of what progress Mexico makes, there is an opportunity on our side of the border to ensure that waste received from Mexico is identified. Once such waste crosses the border, it's required to have a U.S. manifest which identifies the foreign generator. EPA, under an informal arrangement with customs officials located along the border, has been obtaining some manifests. However, not all manifests are received by EPA, and those that are do not always contain complete information because Customs doesn't require it. The August 91 draft environmental border plan calls for a binational hazardous waste generation and disposition database and a transboundary shipment tracking system. However, the plan does not address how these will be developed. For this reason, we are recommending that EPA and SIDUI develop specific <coughs> agreements on implementation responsibilities, resource requirements, and tasking milestones. EPA would have to rely on customs provided manifests to collect data from the binational data and tracking systems. However, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this informal process is not very reliable. For this reason, we're recommending that EPA reach formal agreement with Customs to obtain copies of all manifests for hazardous waste shipped from Mexico into the United States. However, to make this information useful, Customs must require accurate and complete manifests as a condition for entry of the hazardous waste into the United States. Mr. Chairman, uh, this concludes my prepared remarks, and we'll be happy to respond to any questions you'd have at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Hembro, for that report. Let's, uh, let's look at this uh, Makia Ladora situation. What types of manufacturing operations make up the, the industries in the Makia Ladora? Well, the industries, uh, Mr. Chairman, would, it, uh, as you know, they're labor-intensive processing and assembly operations, which use, uh, for the most part, U.S. raw materials. Uh, we are talking about electronics, uh, the electronics industry, the building of electronic circuit boards, automobile parts assembly, chemical manufacturing, plastics, metal finishing, and textiles. What kind of uh, waste do they generate? Well, they generate a lot of bad stuff. Uh, I think that's the best way to characterize it. Uh, by the nature of the industry, they're using things like solvents and acids, caustic materials, which uh, by their nature uh, uh, fit, well fit the definition of hazardous waste. And what kind of environmental problems are created by improper management of these wastes? Well, I think recognizing what we have to deal with in the United States, it's basically the same types of problems. Uh, we're talking about contamination of our groundwater and surface waters, which in many cases, of course, uh, are relied on for drinking water, as well as uh, that contamination uh, posing potential bioaccumulation problems in uh, the food chain, uh, air quality problems, and of course, contamination of the soil itself. Now, your testimony uh, states that under the annex to the 83 Border and Environmental Agreement that the United States is required uh, for, uh, to readmit for disposal all the waste that, that is generated utilizing uh, U.S. materials. Now, Mexico's law, uh, you say in your testimony, requires that the maquiladoras uh, return the waste to the country where the raw materials is originated. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. Uh, Mexico would be required to readmit hazardous waste generated by the U.S. companies uh, using Mexican raw materials. Uh, but we really don't have any information we don't have. There isn't much information available on the extent that U.S. companies are using the Mexican raw material. Now, is the key reason that the United States has agreed to take it back is to ensure that the waste is handled properly? Uh, I would say that's uh, one of the primary reasons, without question. Uh, according to, uh, to SIDUI officials, uh, 
Mexico only has about three commercial facilities in country that can handle the hazardous waste. And quite frankly, according to SEDUI officials, uh, those facilities may not even be sufficient to handle uh, uh, the non maquilador waste. Mm -hmm. Again, according to your testimony, EPA doesn't even know how many uh, maquiladoras are along the border that are generating waste, and they don't even know how much that waste is generated. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that is correct. Uh, I think, as you mentioned in, in your statement, Mr. Chairman, and as uh, Mr. Bustamante mentioned, uh, there, the, the ballpark estimate is about 2,000 maquiladoras at this point in time. But I would mention that uh, the, those numbers are growing in that 10 to 20 percent a year. So it's a booming business. Uh, about 800 of the maquila doors along the border, keeping in mind there are maquila doors in other part of the country, uh, but the bulk of them up on the border, about 800 have, have been identified as uh, generating hazardous waste. Only about 450 of those uh, maquila doors that would be generating hazardous waste, or about half of that 800 universe, have registered with SEDUI as required by the Mexican law and even fewer than that are complying with the manifest requirements. I think the universe of those complying are in the low 300s right now. So if we don't know how many are generating it and we don't know how much of the waste is supposed to be coming back, uh, can we even tell whether or not uh, the waste is actually being uh, shipped back and properly disposed of? I would say the answer to that is no. Uh, a pretty short, sweet answer. Uh, what I can say, and, and we can discuss at your pleasure, is there are some actions to try to get a better handle on the information, but at this point in time, the answer is no. So you would generally agree that it's a widespread belief along the border that this waste is not coming back and under the agreement uh, that we've made between uh, uh, Mexico and the United States? I've seen a lot of statements, Mr. Chairman, that have referred to the border area as a toxic waste dump, to be very honest with you. But uh, because of the uh, absence of information, we don't really know ourselves. We were not able to determine that. Uh, but I think it's safe, based on discussions with SEDUI officials, uh, that there is a recognition that not all of that waste is making its way back into the United States. Well, given the capacity waste problems that Mexico faces itself, uh, is it fair to conclude based upon that that the uh, waste may be improperly being disposed of uh, along the border? I think at this point in time it's a legitimate concern, yes. Is uh, the hazardous waste being illegally dumped? Uh, we know for a fact that it is. Uh, there are instances of illegal dumping of hazardous waste in country. In fact, I could cite one example passed on to us by SEDUI officials where there were 25 uh, maquila doors that were dumping hazardous waste into a municipal landfill, and uh, uh, someone had reported that to SEDUI, and SEDUI acted on it. So illegal dumping is occurring. And that increases the chance of environmental damage as well as health problems. There's no question about that, and not just necessarily on the Mexican side, because the fact that uh, we're talking about border operations and uh, you know shared use of things like surface water and groundwater and of course air quality uh, that uh, it has its uh, detrimental environmental and health risk both on the Mexican side and the U.S. side. Mr. Point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, uh, is it your judgment that Sedui is, is uh, earnest, serious about uh, trying to improve their performance in this area? Do you sense that there's any sort of economic pressure on them or pressure from economic interest uh, to, uh, to not proceed uh, vigorously to correct the situation that exists? Uh, Mr. Klinger, I would say, and my team uh, spent a lot of time talking with Sedui officials, that uh, the sense they certainly got is that uh, the Mexican government is sincere in wanting to, to come to grips with the, uh, with the problems. Uh, and you know, we can discuss, uh, I think, one of the key problems that the Mexican government is going to be faced with, and that is uh, trying to make resources available to keep pace, or in this case, to catch up with the growth that's occurring and the potential problems that can come off of that. What about the... Uh, uh, the one of the great uh, lacks here, obviously, as you've indicated, is that uh, we don't have adequate data as to uh, the number of maquiladoras, the number producing uh, waste, uh, and uh, all of the rest of it. 
uh, are we pretty much dependent upon what SIDUI provides us with in terms of data? Is there any, do we have an independent way to, to develop uh, that kind of data or what, are we relying heavily on the Mexican sources? There's going to have to be reliance on Mexico for, if not all, a good portion of uh, the information. Be uh, if for no other reason uh, the government of Mexico is in the best position. Uh, you know, by law, these facilities should be registering. They should be providing manifest. So uh, I, I think you have to look to Mexico to be a key player in the development of the information. There are probably some things that can be done by EPA in the United States, but this is truly a situation where you're going to have to have a partnership when it comes to developing the information. Otherwise, whatever you end up with is not going to be very reliable. And of course, the information, Mr. Klinger, is just one part of it. More importantly is what that information says, and that is uh, the types of hazardous waste and, and how much of it is coming in so that we're in a position back here to deal with it. Indicated that the uh, <coughs> numbers of maquiladors are increasing dramatically, yeah, that uh, <coughs> this is really a growth uh, area. Is that uh, because of the uh, uh, lower cost labor, or do you think that there's a possibility also that it's because uh, the, the environmental standards are not as rigid and therefore uh, there's an advantage from a cost point of view to dispose and, and the disposal of this stuff to do it on the other side of the border. Well, there's no question and, and GAO has done some work uh, on this issue uh, looking at it from some different directions that uh, labor costs are certainly a prime reason. I, I, we've seen figures where on the U.S. side of the border the wage rate for these types of activities perhaps are in a, the range of fourteen fifteen dollars an hour compared to on the mexican side it being about a dollar fifty an hour but there is also uh, a lot of folks that will suggest that as the u.s. environmental laws become more and more stringent that that is just some added pressure perhaps being placed on u.s. industries to uh, give some thought to relocating a lot of their labor-intensive uh, activities uh, south of the border mm -hmm. <clears throat> you state that the Customs Service has not established any regulations specifically governing the entrant, entry of hazardous waste from Mexico back into the United States. Did you investigate why they have not developed uh, some regulations, why they have been uh, derelict in this regard? I, I don't know if I would call it derelict. Uh, you know, uh, these agencies have a lot of stuff to do. Uh, and I think that when it comes to uh, the movement of goods back and forth across the border that Customs uh, has plenty on their plate to, to just stay up with what's coming back and forth across. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting though. Uh, EPA and Customs has a memorandum of agreement that governs the movement of hazardous waste from the United States uh, to countries outside, but they don't have a similar memorandum of agreement that formalizes that movement of uh, hazardous material from foreign countries such as uh, Mexico and our neighbors to the North Canada into the United States. Uh, what Customs and EPA will tell you, as they've told us, is that they are now thinking about that and that they plan to have some discussions on that, but at this point in time, uh, it's a fairly loose informal arrangement that in most cases have been initiated on, not on the part of Customs but on the part of EPA and or uh, some of the border state agencies that are very much concerned about uh, the movement of the hazardous waste back into the United States. What uh, kind of changes would uh, you have any recommendations as to what sort of changes uh, EPA might adapt for uh, to the current manifest system to get a better uh, sense uh, for what we're doing to better ha regulate hazardous waste. Well, I can uh, certainly uh, ask Mr. Fuller to to help me out on this uh, based on the work that our Office of Spe Special Investigations did up on the Canadian border. But uh, based on the Makila Door work that we've done, uh, it seems clear to us that uh, you need a to begin with, you need a formal agreement. It needs to be uh, to serve as a clear base for the establishment of policies and procedures that uh, will uh, 
uh, facilitate this interaction between EPA and Customs. And you need to be very specific as to what your needs are. Right now, what you have happening is where there are some manifests, you're not always sure of who the foreign generator is, you're not always sure of the type of waste that's coming about, you're not always sure of the uh, amount of waste that's coming back or its ultimate destination. So I think that you need the formal agreement and then you need specificity brought in so that you can help your customs officials uh, make sure that they're getting the right information before the stuff crosses the border and then that information is then passed on uh, quickly to EPA so they're in a position uh, to know what they're dealing with under RICRA. Just one final uh, question. Uh, as I understand it, any material that is recyclable is not required then to be re-exported um, back into the United States for disposal. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to the Maquiladora process of bringing in raw materials and then export, uh, the materials uh, would come into the country uh, import free and uh, as long as the finished goods as well as any of the hazardous waste associated with the production goes back, there's, there's no problem. Uh, Mexico will allow, uh, with their approval, uh, hazardous waste uh, generated from a maquiladora to stay in country and be recycled because, uh, you know, as the saying goes, one person's trash is another person's treasure. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I guess my question is, happen. who determines what is recyclable and what isn't? I mean, is there are there fairly well? Uh, what would happen is a, a facility would indicate an, an interest with a re uh, authorized. And I'd like to emphasize an authorized Mexican recycling or reuse uh, facility uh, to apply to to obtain that waste, and uh, with that approval, then it. Uh, it would stay in country and be recycled. But interestingly enough, and we can talk about this in more detail if you want, uh, that doesn't necessarily, even though that technically means it's no longer maquilador waste, that waste is still coming back across the border into the United States. And as long as it has someone that will receive it and take responsibility for it, it will come back across the border. And it can come back across. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. Mr. Bustamani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hembra, on... Um in this uh, agreement between EPA and Customs, uh, this agreement doesn't involve, say, DUE or the Mexican Customs on the other side to have some uh, degree of checks as, as this waste crosses the border? Uh, I, if you're referring to uh, the need for the agreement uh, right now, uh, uh, the discussions, as I understand it right now, would be just between EPA and Customs, although I, I'd, quite honestly, I'd be hard-pressed to believe that they could strike that memorandum of agreement without getting, you know, their, their counterparts involved to some extent. Yeah, it seems to me, and some of us have been talking about sort of a, a free zone area in which we could have EPA go onto the Mexican side and the same thing, the Mexicans come onto the American side and check uh, for any type of violations or any concerns that we might have. After all, both of us along the Rio Grande uh, use the Rio Grande as one of our main water, or as our main water source for many of our cities. The Mexican side ought to be concerned because most of the cities along the Mexican side have about anywhere from six to ten times the population of the American counterpart uh, city. And so uh, uh, those or some of the real concerns that we've been addressing, especially those of us that that represent uh, the border areas of the United States with Mexico, from Arizona, New Mexico, California, all the way to South Texas. And it seems to me that we would, uh, and we'll recommend this to Carla Hill, that there be some type of a free zone area because there have been violations. I don't know how much uh, our water has been contaminated by waste or because uh, there is there are sources of information that tell us that some of these waste has gone into the Rio Grande. We cannot, uh, you know, yet ascertain that. So I am concerned. Now, Sadue, Mr. Chairman, for a long time was a very unstable, unstable organization. And I guess you pointed out that they had a budget of 13 million. But it seemed to for a while, and I've been dealing with them uh, or talking to the, 
the Mexican office at times, and every time I call, there'd be a different uh, head of, of Sadui. And I'm hoping that uh, this latest one, and I don't know how long he or she has been in the office, but I'm hoping that as they get to, what, $100 million now with the, with the loan that is proposed, or they're supposed to get from the uh, World Bank, yeah, they will. They, uh, I think they're close to agreement and approval on a $45 million loan, although I, I, I should point out that that's not going to be a lump sum payment that uh, is going to uh, just deal with their operations and activities in 1992. That loan's going to be spread out, but there will be matching government funds added to it. So I would expect at a minimum, as it relates to envi uh, Sidui's environmental protection budget, that now it's about 30, 39 million, and I would expect to see a, a fairly significant increase, uh, in, but probably more in terms of tens of millions as opposed to 100 million. Yeah. Well, I, I would hope that, that uh, we could, and this is not in your area, but that uh, the Congress, the administration, and of course the Mexican government would realize and uh, try to understand that the northern cities of Mexico or getting most of the population. Right now, the greatest increase in population is along the northern cities of Mexico. And if you go into uh, the uh, Matamoros area, into the Reynosa area, you can see what they're doing there. The, the chanties that are just all over the place, without any control, no infrastructure. And I know President uh, Salinas de Gortari has talked about putting a billion dollars uh, in, along the border in infrastructure, but it'll be very slow in coming. In the meantime, we have tremendous concerns about not only hazardous waste, but also, of course, uh, uh, the dumping of, uh, of raw sewage on the river. And that has taken place above Laredo, and we're concerned, of course, above uh, Del Rio. And now that I'm going to be... Uh, campaigning a little bit beyond that, another 100, 400 miles or five. <laughs> I am concerned all the way from almost Santa Fe, it seems that way, into the southern area. So I'm hoping that uh, EPA will work closely in those areas. And we will certainly keep on applying a lot of pressure to the Sedua group. But it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that we need to have some type of a free zone in those areas so that both the Mexican uh, EPA, Sedua, and our EPA will have a free run of those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bustamante. Mr. Clue. No mm -hmm. Mr. Hembra, you said to Mr. Bustamante's question that the uh, Sedui's resources were about $39 million for pollution control activities. Is that, cor is that correct? Uh, $39 million this year, yes, that's correct. What was RICRA's, uh, our Resource Conservation Recovery Act's budget uh, for hazardous waste activities in 91? Uh, yeah, I mentioned in my uh, prepared statement, Mr. Chairman, that uh, <coughs> that was on the order of about three, uh, $311 million. Okay, what kind of enforcement program does SEDUI have along the border, uh, particularly with respect to the requirement to ship waste back into the country of origin? Uh, they do have a... Uh, uh, inspection enforcement program. Um, uh, prior to 1991, uh, as far as numbers of inspectors, it was very small, uh, less than 20. And now uh, this year they have it up a little over 100. I think it's 113. Uh, and the inspectors go in and they uh, they check for all. Uh, they check a facility out for all environmental problems. It's a little different than we work in the United States, where we kind of have media-specific programs. Uh, with their the passage of their general law in 1988, it's a, it's a rather comprehensive approach to dealing with environmental protection. Uh, but they're checking the facility. F I think the important point here is they're checking the facility for everything, not just necessarily hazardous waste. So I would say, given the uh, universe they have to cover and the numbers now available that uh, pr presents uh, a real challenge. Uh. Now, uh, some of these enforcement actions result in the plant being closed and uh, I th when I think of a plant being closed, I mean, I think about stopping the business totally. Is that what happens when we close a plant or uh, when Sedui closes a plant? I would say that is uh, the exception, not the rule. Uh, Mr. Yes. Richie, sure. On that, yes, I, I've been acquainted with the ones in Piedras Negras that they closed, and they just came in and closed them, period. That's correct. Until all remedies would be addressed, 
according to the information that I've had, from the Mexican owner on the other side. But uh, nonetheless, I would say that's the exception, not the rule. And normally what happens is uh, an inspector would go in and see a violation and they would tend to close down that part of the operation that is contributing to the violation. And, uh, you know, it's usually temporary in nature. It's just a lever to try to get the, uh, the facility to quickly come back into compliance. So, so it's a very not, fluid term when we say closing. Uh, I would characterize it could as... Could be just uh, for a couple uh, of hours and they're open and running again. Could be a couple hours, just could be overnight and they're back in business again. That's correct. Now, Mr. Hember, your statement says that from January through August of 1991, SEDUI conducted inspections on 120 maquiladoras, uh, resulting in 56 partial or temporary closing. Now, what kind of violations were found? Uh, we're talking about, and uh, we got this information uh, readily from uh, SEDUI, uh, we're talking about air and water emission violations, uh, um, less than adequate uh, uh, hazardous waste management in general and in addition a failure to report uh, or a failure to export hazardous waste back to the originating uh, originating uh, country. So that's pretty serious stuff. That's just not record keeping uh, violations, isn't it? Well, it's certainly more than re record keeping. It's uh, some real serious problems and we're talking about illegal uh, activities and uh, the types of things that create uh, and pose the uh, potential health and environmental risk. Now, does SEDUI have plans to increase and improve their enforcement? Uh, they do. Uh, whether they're realized is a, is, a, is a different issue, but they certainly have plans. And uh, le I, let me mention three. One, of course, I've already mentioned, and that is the World Bank loan, which will make some more m uh, money available, although at this point in time, uh, I don't think anyone's sure how much of it goes directly to pollution control. Uh, they're also uh, considering, and I think understandably so because of this exponential growth up along the border area, to try to uh, uh, kind of privatize the inspection process where they would certify inspectors, the companies in fact would pay for the inspectors to come in and, and that would make more inspectors uh, available. Although based on what we know and looking at environmental programs, that doesn't reduce the need for SEDUI to be pretty active as far as overseeing that. Uh, and the, uh, the third point, which, let me think for a minute what I was... Uh, Talk to me about capacity. Because oh, let, let me, yeah, the third point, I'm sorry, let me mention one other thing. And that is, in the United States, the environmental uh, programs, states have uh, taken responsibility for implementing a lot of them. And right now in Mexico, most of the uh, uh, inspection enforcement and control of the environmental programs is centralized in the federal government. And they're thinking ahead of trying to get the states to pick up some of that responsibility. And if it works out right, that could help them. So there's really three, I think, efforts they're doing. Talk to me about hazardous waste disposal capacity. Are they planning to increase that? Because as we know, they have very limited capacity down there. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, based on our discussions with SEDUI officials, they have no plans at this point in time to increase their capacity. I think what they're hoping is that they can convince U.S. firms to come in and uh, uh, create uh, sites uh, to handle and dispose now of Do we export waste, waste to Mexico? Uh, Mexico doesn't accept hazardous waste for disposal, but we do export some to Mexico. Uh, what kind is that? Uh, that's basically waste that uh, Mexico has agreed to receive because it can be recycled and they can get something from it. A specific example, I think, uh, is uh, the uh, electric uh, arc furnace dust that comes off of steel manufacturing. We're, Mex uh, we're shipping it down to Mexico to the recycling facilities and they're taking out the, uh, the metals from that dust. Now, as we described in uh, our statements, the, the way this process works is the waste is disposed of once and then it, it, it goes down to Mexico and it's supposed to come back. Now, does it go back to the company that uh, it came from uh, in Texas uh, or wherever, or does it go to a landfill site in, in border states like Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, or whatever? Well, once again, there's not a whole lot of reliable information. But what we do know is that uh, on the U.S. side of the border, uh, the firms that have set up maquiladores in Mexico set up a lot of uh, 
uh, handling facilities and, and warehouses of, of such, and that's where the raw, raw materials come out of, going, and they go into Mexico, and then the products and the waste are returned there. So I'd venture to guess, and it's a pretty safe bet, that probably right now the bulk of the hazardous waste coming back into the United States is, is coming to uh, states such as Texas and Louisiana, uh, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and California. Okay. Now, what about the, the Basel Convention? How will this affect this whole maquilador-generated waste situation? As far as the framework that's in place, the agreement between the United States and Mexico with regard to the handling of waste coming back and forth across the border, it, it shouldn't have any impact. And the reason I say it shouldn't is because, on paper, that's a pretty sound agreement, and uh, the framework is there. So our, our sense at this point in time uh, the convention in and of itself won't have any, uh, certainly no, any detrimental effect on it. And based on my reading of the convention, I don't necessarily think it would particularly enhance uh, what's happening right now uh, with regard to the agreements reached on dealing with the Maquila doors. Okay. Mr. Klein? Just with regard to the disposal of, the, of their own waste <coughs> in Mexico, uh, what uh, uh, are their landfills, are their disposal uh, sites and so forth uh, equal in, in quality or in, in standards to the United States? Well, I have to admit, we didn't try to assess uh, right. the, the difference in the quality of the facilities. Uh, uh, and I think basically what, at this point in time what's more important is what the capacity issue itself. And, and what we do know for a fact is there's very few of them, I, I think only three at this point in time. And they're having trouble from a capacity standpoint, just dealing with non maquilador hazardous waste. I should mention to you that, uh, you know, the universe of maquiladors right now, in the ballpark estimate, estimate is about 2,000. Uh, Mexico has probably 120,000 facilities, you know, that they're trying to watch over. Uh, so, uh, uh, Maquila Doras represent a pretty small portion of their the overall universe of potential uh, generators of, of waste and even hazardous waste. I mean, we're obligated to receive back the um, the waste that are generated at the Maquila Door. Is there any evidence that we're uh, receiving more back than, than we should? In other words, are we uh, getting more waste uh, from other installations? Uh, there's uh, certainly that likelihood uh, that we could. Uh, <coughs> Because of the absence of information, and in that sense, it's almost an absence of controls right now. Uh, a lot of it is resource-driven, of course. You know, the potential is there to 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 mix raw materials, mm -hmm. and once you begin commingling uh, raw materials, then you could very easily be getting something back more than you than you sent down. Uh, but a key point, and this is where I think there there can be some confusion. Uh, there, there's uh, firms other than U.S. Uh, maquila doors. I mean, you have German and Japanese uh, uh, maquila door operations, but that doesn't necessarily mean the raw materials are coming from Germany and Japan. Those materials, in fact, could be coming from the United States. The key then is that that waste would go back to the United States, regardless of who who happens to own the firm. It's where the raw materials come from that dictates where the waste ultimately goes. Mm -hmm. But there is obviously uh, a potential for commingling, and I think it really uh, becomes clear in those cases where wastes go to a recycling facility and then the ultimate residue hazardous waste off the recycling operations, you'll see that coming back in. And we have a specific example with Chem Waste Company uh, in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, Mr. Fuller, in the, uh, in the written testimony that you provided us, with um, <clears throat> addressing Canadian hazardous waste shipments, you state that even if additional resources were available, for example, spot checks, uh, there, that there would still be logistical problems. Uh, I wonder if you could explain uh, this further and uh, what might you suggest to get around some of these problems. Uh, one of the problems we found, in addition to uh, the lack of resources, which every agency would say they have a problem, would be the trained uh, personnel being adequately trained to administer it, the f uh, equipment that would necessarily be needed to test the samples coming across the border, uh, a backlog at the border. Our report uh, sort of, or our testimony enumerates several issues which 
we were cited uh, by individuals that we interviewed in the law enforcement and environmental community as factors which would impact on it. Did your investigation provide any information regarding the kinds of operators who are most likely to be involved in illegal fuel blending? Of the people <coughs> we interviewed, the most likely would be small, unscrupulous type operators uh, because large type operators would not engage in such practices for fear of losing their license or uh, being involved in criminal or civil activity. Uh, what, how big is that universe, would you say? I mean, uh, we were unable to determine the universe of the people. Uh, based on all of the interviews we did across all of the border states, we could not come up with a specific universe as to the number of uh, a number or amount of activity going on in illegal blending of fuel products. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of obstacles or problems might there be in shifting accountability for the testing and the proper disposal of blended fuel products to users, as some have suggested might be a solution? Some, <laughs> of, the, some of the people we talked to did suggest that uh, that maybe the responsibility or ultimate responsibility should be sh uh, transferred to the end user. One of the problems we found there were that if a lot of these end users were like small cement keels or something, they couldn't afford the expense of testing or uh, of the type of testing that would be required. Most of them test purely to determine if it's going to impact on their operation of their equipment. But one of the major points that, uh, that was made to us was that small business operators using these recycled or reprocessed fuels or hazardous waste fuels uh, didn't have the facilities or the money to uh, test these facilities. Uh, so it's unrealistic to think that right. they could assume the responsibility. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Clayton. <coughs> I'm a little puzzled in that you indicated you thought there were some cases of illegal fuel blending going on, but you really couldn't prove any cases of it. Is that as I understand it? Is your supposition that it indeed might exist? It's uh, It's been supposition for quite a long time. Several years ago, uh, in fact, back in 1989, there was like a whole series of newspaper articles that dealt with fuel cocktailing immediately after uh, Chairman Zinar's, I believe, last hearing. And the allegations were that uh, unscrupulous people <coughs> were engaging in disposing of PCBs um, and hazardous waste materials by blending it with, sometimes with good fuel products to increase the volume for sale. Uh, there was a border checkpoint set up immediately after this situation arose, uh, the United States and Canada engaged in uh, spot checks. Canada tested over 700 vehicles coming across the border in upstate New York, and of the 700 tests, they found none. Uh, the United States spot checked several and found none. The U.S. Attorney for the Western District of New York established a working group to review the situation. Uh, their working group came up with a finding of we believe it's a problem, but we basically don't know how large the problem is. This is certainly isn't a problem, though, that's specifically unique to international shipments. Fuel blending has been a problem in the past in the United States itself. State to state, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Hembro, another exception to this waste return requirement could occur where the United States' raw material is shipped to the Maquiladora, but the Maquiladora nationalizes that raw material and it becomes Mexican uh, raw material. Is there any waste resulting from that processing and how is that dealt with? There is waste and uh, it, uh, it, it can be uh, sent back to the United States. That seems like a pretty big loophole. Uh, Absent controls and absent good information, uh, it can create uh, a very large loophole. That's correct. Now, let me um, go back to the question. Now, I understand that in 1989, EPA Region 6 put together a Maquiladora Industries Generator Guide for use by the environmental inspectors. It describes, I'm told, 10 industrial processes and the types and amounts of waste expected to be generated as a result of those processes. Now, has EPA tried to work with uh, SEDUI to utilize that guide uh, to estimate the amount of waste that it should be returning? Uh, 
I think their intent is that they uh, will be working with Sadui uh, to take advantage of it. But uh, once again, I think that's something that's more connected with the border plan, and it's something that will get done or is supposed to be done as opposed to right now it's being done. And to be quite honest with you, I've looked at that, that guidance, and uh, uh, it, it's, I think the specificity that, that that you mentioned, uh, I don't necessarily see it in there. That it, it's very helpful because it does give some general descriptions, but I don't think that in and of itself is going to be the formula for anyone to compute how much hazardous waste is going to be coming off the raw materials. You also mentioned that EPA and Sedui have conducted joint inspections at these facilities. What about those efforts? Uh, there has been some joint inspections, uh, I think about 24 over the last uh, two or three years on both sides of the border. Uh, uh, those types of inspections are viewed as educational, an educational exercise. It helps, uh, uh, it helps the uh, Mexican inspectors uh, uh, learn from EPA and in some cases it helps EPA learn from Mexico. But I think over the last three years there's been probably about 24. 24 doesn't seem like a lot over three years. Uh, 24 certainly isn't a lot if, uh, you know, your purpose is to go out and find noncompliance. Uh, it may not even be enough uh, when you're talking about the educational value. I was going to say, off it. that's got to be minimal on training. Let me go back to where Mr. Klug was taking us with his question. It is illegal to blend hazardous waste with fuels in all cases, is it not? Uh, Let me ask Mr. Fuller, is that sure. correct? Uh, that depends on what kind of fuels we're talking about, Mr. Chairman. Well, wh why do companies blend fuels? Let's start with there. Why do they blend? Well, f one is under RICRA, uh, under hazardous waste fuels, they're authorized to blend it uh, because it's a source of energy recovery. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> it's illegal to blend hazardous waste or other contaminants such as PCBs with new fuel oil. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have another quality of fuel called off-specification. Uh, which is allowed to be blended up to a certain level of, level of halogens. And after that, it then goes into hazardous waste fuel, which, like I said before, can be burned for energy recovery under RICRA. All right. Let's turn to an actual case that you all looked into subsequent to our review of this PCV fuel blending <laughs> allegation. Now, as I understand it, uh, there were 5,500 gallons of liquid flammable waste that uh, were shipped from a company named A.A. A. Anderson in British Columbia by Lily Plaid uh, Petroleum in Tacoma, Washington. I'd ask unanimous consent at this point to enter into the record the manifest that GO used to track this shipment of waste. Now, Mr. Fuller, GAO believes that the shipment of waste originated in British Columbia, correct? Um, a tracing analysis we did would indicate that at least a portion of the 5,500 gallons originated uh, in Canada at the University of British Columbia. Now, why did, why did Lilypad import the waste? Uh, Lilyblad has an ongoing agreement with A.A. Anderson. Uh, we were told that routinely, uh, in a routine business deal, that A.A. That a. A. Anderson is a longtime company of, or customer of Lilyblad, and that they are in the business of disposing of waste solvents and petroleum products. They were contacted and asked if they would do it, and they agreed to do it. Now, did Lilyblad uh, test the waste to see what it was made up of? Uh, they were cited and fined by the state of Washington for not testing this particular shipment of waste. Now, Lilyblad arranged to have that waste sent to Continental Cement in Hannibal, Missouri to be used for fuel as a, a cement kill. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Through a waste broker, the uh, shipment was sent from Lilyblad to Continental Cement. And what was that shipment? Uh, that shipment when it first came into the country from A.A. A. Anderson to Lily Blad, just indicated uh, waste fuels not otherwise specified or specific. Uh, when Continental received it, they tested it uh, and found DDT, DDE, chloridane, and a level of PCBs in it. Uh, the shipment was subsequently determined by Continental not to be suitable for use in their cement processing. Now, uh, you are, we are correct that DDT and DDE and chloridane pesticides are banned for use in the United States. So I guess the natural question is why would these pesticides be found in shipments of spent solvents? 
those pesticides are no longer used in the United States, and they could have been added anywhere along the way of the shipment. Now, who was the generator identified on the manifest? On the manifest, Lilyblad would be, gener uh, would be listed as the generator. Well, what happened to the waste once Continental rejected it? Uh, once Continental rejected the waste, Lilyblad directed the waste broker who was involved to ship the waste to Marine Shell processors down in Morgan City, Louisiana. Now, did Marine Shell accept the waste? Uh, no, sir. Marine Shell also tested it, found that it had excessive levels of halogens, and rejected the shipment. Then what happened? Uh, the shipment then was shipped from Marine Shell to GSX Recovery Systems in Crowley, Louisiana. GSX, upon testing it, determined that they were not authorized to dispose of it. They contacted Rollins uh, Environmental Services. Uh, Rollins is an unauthorized TSD, Treatment Storage and Disposal Facility, and Rollins disposed of it. Uh, GSX issued a certificate of disposal to Lilyblad, and in turn, Rollins issued a certificate of disposal to GSX. Well, this seems like uh, one heck of an odyssey for one shipment. Uh, do you think that emergency personnel that would have dealt with this could have adequately handled it uh, if there had been an accident or a spill? Uh, given the information, if there had been a had of been a spill, there could have been serious problems. For example, some waste, maybe not in this particular case, react differently with chemicals that are used to treat spills. Uh, if the waste aren't properly listed on the manifest and an accident occurs, emergency personnel could be exposed to health and safety violations and perhaps create an even a larger problem. Well, did the uh, manifest identify the, uh, or the original generator of waste that could be consulted? No, sir. A. A. Anderson, in fact, in Canada would have been the true generator of this waste, but once it crossed the U.S. border, it takes on the characteristic of the importer, which then became Lilyblad. Well, did, has EPA taken any disciplinary action on this for the parties that were involved? Uh, to the best of our knowledge, no, but that might be a question best posed to EPA, sir. Well, let's ask about the broker who arranged for the shipment to these places. Are there any requirement for these folks who brokered this uh, waste to be registered with EPA or have some kind of background <coughs> in waste management? As far as we can determine, EPA does not regulate brokers directly. EPA regulates the generator, the transporter, and the receiving facilities. There's no specific requirement that brokers be trained or have any background in the management of hazardous waste. Uh, we were advised by EPA that only if the broker takes physical possession of a shipment of waste do they then become the generator and subject to EPA regulations. Well, this is a, a sorry story because this waste bounced around us. We just illustrated from following it all over the place. Uh, Mr. Fuller, are there any requirements that this waste uh, go to the destination listed on the manifest or go back to the uh, country where it came from? Normally on a manifest, uh, it will have a designated facility that it's going to. It might also point out an alternate receiver. Uh, in this particular case, there was only the one. Once it got down and started bouncing around, uh, there was no indication of where it had to go. Uh, let's look. Let's the, look. Go ahead. It's the responsibility of the person that rejects the shipment to contact the generator and ask them where they want the load to go next. Hmm. Now, our, the records also indicate, if I'm reading them correctly, that after testing the shipment, Continental added the waste codes for the pesticides found in the shipment onto the manifest. But then those notations were later deleted. Now, is there a requirement that the results of the testing of the shipment uh, while in transit be included in the manifest? We were advised by EPA that there is nothing specific to require the reason for the shipment being Should rejected. there be? probably would be a good idea, sir. Do you think that the shipping manifests uh, illustrate uh, a clear chain of custody here? Uh, in this particular case, no, but we believe that the uniform manifest system does have a provision that, that there is a clear chain of custody from cradle to grave from the origin of the shipment through final disposal. Okay. Now, during your review, did you find a problem with Customs and EPA ensuring that these manifests coming across contain completed information? We did, unless uh, Customs has a specific reason to uh, check a load of fuel coming across, they accept it at face value, as whatever the manifest says on it. Uh, furthermore, one of the Customs import specialists that we talked with 
told us that he pulls the manifest off of a truckload of shipment coming or a truckload of fuel shipment coming across the border and uh, it may be two weeks before that piece of paper gets to the appropriate office so the load may already have been disposed of by the time he gets the actual manifest paper in his office well it seems to at least to me that these aren't just merely uh, technical admissions that they could have some serious potential uh, consequences if an accident or a spill occurred am i overreacting uh, no, I don't believe you're overreacting, sir. Okay. Mr. Klinger? Just one question. How is it, was this a unique instance, or do you have other examples of the, this kind of activity going on? We have been told on numerous occasions that shipments will cross the border. They will go to uh, one designated facility. That facility, for some reason, will reject it, whether it's because of a water content or having, ha you know, have chemicals or something in it, and then it will get shipped to a broker, or a broker will get involved and broker it off to someone else for disposal. But but this was the most egregious example of, of this activity. That right, sir, and we were specifically asked to look at this. It came up in the course of our initial investigation. Chairman Sinar then asked that we sort of track this one shipment for him. What, uh, is there something better we could do at the border to... Uh, to prevent this, or the concern would be if we, you know, how uh, how much of, a, of an imposition would it be to strengthen the controls at the border? That would be very difficult. The, uh, I guess the best thing I can tell you on that one is the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of New York, uh, in his conversations with us, told us that uh, the only thing we could do in this area would be more vigilant, and I'm not sure exactly what he meant by that, but uh, I, I assume he meant that we needed more manpower and more resources to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Clay. If I could walk me back through a couple of these steps. Did Lily Blad get paid by this company in Canada to dispose of the waste? That one we do not know, Mr. Clue. We, we did not ask Lily Blad whether they were paid to dispose of the shipment. Like you said, they were a long-time associate business customer. Uh, a lot of times uh, there is no money transfer. Uh, it's simply uh, a disposal of some of the stuff serves a purpose for a company. They find a way to get rid of it by shipping it to a cement kiln. In fact, there are instances where people have actually paid cement kilns to take hazardous or to take this hazardous waste fuel and burn it because they're authorized to burn it. Okay, but theoretically, in this situation, what might have happened is that Anderson shipped it to Lilyblad, who then made money by selling it to the cement kiln. That's correct, sir. They could have made money. Okay. Now, is it normal that the cement company would test the fuel? This particular company said they tested every load that came in because they were afraid of damage to their equipment. And certain chemical and impurities in some of these fuel oils will cause their cement processing not okay. to work as it should. Now, were they aware of any other cases like this where they'd intercepted toxic chemicals in, in the fuel blend? Uh, that I don't remember. I do recall them rejecting a shipment because of some water, uh, an overvolume of water in the fuel, but uh, not other chemicals. I don't recall that. Okay. Um, back to another dollar question. Do you have any sense at all what it ultimately cost the company to dispose of this between the shipments back and forth and then the final disposal? And if memory serves me correct, on this particular instance, it was $12,500 that it, they ended up paying to actually dispose of the shipment that probably would have been much less than that had the cement kill burned it. And do you know, is there still a relationship between the Canadian and the American companies? Uh, I'm unaware of that, sir. Okay. And because of this, has um, either the EPA or any other U.S. agency asked for an investigation into the Canadian firm? And is there any ability of the American government to prevent any further shipments from this Canadian company now coming into the country? The state of Washington has an ongoing action uh, against the importer in this case, and I'm not sure exactly what the result of that action is going to be. But is there any ability under the law right now to say because this company shipped this in, they can never ship anything else into the United States? Uh, I don't have the answer to that. EPA might be able to answer that question. Thanks. Mr. Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you know how many inspectors we have that are certified in this area? It says there's a tremendous shortage of personnel train in trying to diagnose what is coming across? 
I don't have uh, a number, and most of... Do we have of, somebody at every port along the U.S.-Canadian border, or do you know? That would be... They, they may be trained in it, but they may not have the facilities to do it. Most of the customs officials at the border crossings we spoke with said... Uh, we're there basically for tariff and revenue purposes, not to go out and stick our hand down in a 55-gallon drum to see what the contents are. This is something, Mr. Chairman, that we might have to make it a requirement of some sort to have trained personnel at each port, just like we do with uh, the movement of vegetables, or what do you call uh, what is that the department that handles it, the FDA, the Department of Agriculture, in this area, and have them trained because we're relying right now mainly on a manifest. And the manifest says, you know, this is to certify that this shipment is this and that without any knowledge of what I, it might contain. That's correct, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bustamani. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bustamani. Mr. Hembra and uh, others, uh, thank you very much for your excellent testimony, and we appreciate the, the excellent work as you, that you did this time, as you always do, very much. Our next panel is Mr. Bowden Train, Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He will be accompanied by Sylvia Lawrence, the Director of Office of Solid Waste. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll back there. I like it. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Hale, Matt Hale. Mr. Train and Ms. Lawrence, do you have any objections to being sworn in? And who Mr. are you? Hale. Mr. Who? Hale. Hale. Will you be testifying? Potentially? Potentially. Okay. All right. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, include into the record your entire testimony. This time we will welcome any comments you might want to share with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Bowden Train, EPA's Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response. And I'm accompanied here today by Ms. Sylvia Lawrence, Director of the Office of Solid Waste, and Mr. Matt Hale, Acting Director for the RICRA Enforcement Division in the Office of Waste Programs Enforcement. We have significantly improved implementation of the Waste Export Program in the last few years, and the current program is working quite well. We've been giving special attention to our relationships with Mexico and Canada to assure that exports to our neighbors are well handled. The U.S. was one of the first nations to adopt prior informed consent as a condition of allowing hazardous waste exports. Current regulations were issued in August 1986. In October and November of 1986, the U.S. signed bilateral agreements with Mexico and Canada. In February 1987, EPA and U.S. Customs signed a Memorandum of Understanding calling for the collection of manifests at the border for exports, spot checks, training for customs officials, and interagency enforcement cooperation. In 1988, EPA's National Enforcement Investigation Center developed a comprehensive strategy for enforcing the export regulations, including use of a database which is evaluated to detect, to detect violations and to target further investigations. This work has resulted in a growing export enforcement program with actions and penalties increasing yearly since 1989. EPA has also begun to focus on waste imports. This year, EPA brought several enforcement actions against firms that violated import regulations. Four of these cases involve Macchiadora waste. The receiving facility failed to provide the required advance notice. In September, EPA filed 16 enforcement actions involving noncompliance with waste import-export regulations <coughs> with total, total penalties over $3 million. EPA recently moved daily operation of the Notice and Consent Program to the Office of Waste Programs Enforcement. 
improving our ability to relate the information available to enforcement planning and action. EPA received a total of 556 export notices in fiscal year 1990, 479 to Canada, 77 elsewhere, 563 notices in 91, including 473 notices for Canada. And so far in, in fiscal year 1992, we've had 74 notices for Canada and two for elsewhere. Most of our imports also involve Canada and Mexico, although our data are not as complete as for exports. Pursuant to the U.S.-Canadian bilateral agreement, EPA received notifications that approximately 150,000 tons of hazardous waste were imported from Canada in 1990, roughly comparable to the 100,000 tons or so exported to Canada. Data for Mexican exports are more limited, if sorry, Mexican imports. Nevertheless, EPA regions 6 and 9 have partial data indicating 2,389 tons of hazardous waste were imported into Region 6 in 1990, and 750 tons and 232,500 gallons were imported into Region 9 during the first eight months of 1991. In addition to specific work to improve implementation of the domestic program, EPA is working with Mexico to improve environmental conditions generally along the border region. In the draft Integrated Border Environmental Plan released for public comment in August of this year, EPA recommended a variety of measures to improve the border environment, including identification of industries in the border region, including an identification of the waste generated. Technology transfer seminars on pollution prevention, waste minimization, pollution control for industries in the border region, and increased EPA SEDUE training, site visits, and exchanges of information. Work on many of these action items has already begun. The border plan calls for the creation of a U.S.-Mexico enforcement work group to identify areas for increasing governmental cooperation on enforcement of environmental laws with the goal of mutually strengthening each company's enforcement cap capabilities. U.S. and Mexican officials have, agreed, have already begun discussing areas for cooperative enforcement. Work has al also already begun on a Region 6 waste tracking system, which is planned to grow into a binational tracking system of waste movements from Maquia Doris to the United States. There are several areas where we would like to further improve our program in order to ratify and implement the Basel Convention. <clears throat> it is critically important for the U.S. to ratify Basel. It is the only way to ensure that the U.S. can fully participate in discussions regarding aspects of Basel implementation, such as liability and a definition for environmentally sound management. Ratification is also important in order to prevent significant interruptions in international trade and recyclables. The U.S. is prevented from ratifying the convention until the Senate provides consent and the Congress provides additional statutory authority. Three key new authorities are needed to meet requirements of the Basel Convention. Authority to control household waste and residues from the incineration of household waste. Authority to stop an export if we have reason to believe that a shipment will not be managed in an environmentally sound manner. And authority to require exporters to return U.S. exported waste that are mismanaged abroad. The administration has proposed a bill which would provide the authorities necessary to implement Basel, H.R. 2398. The administration's approach ensures environmental protection and it provides flexibility necessary to balance diplomatic, political, and economic concerns. The heart of the administration's proposal is a statutory prohibition on imports and exports unless the U.S. has an agreement with a foreign government allowing such shipments. Negotiating bilateral agreements will provide a mechanism for assessing the waste management program in the importing country, even down to the facility level. If we find that adequate environmental protection cannot be assured, then the U.S. will not sign a bilateral agreement. With our proposed legislation, we would be able to respond to information indicating that there may be a problem with the way a shipment of exported U.S. waste was being managed. When EPA evaluates foreign government programs, we will consider the level of control that would apply domestically under RICRA. However, we also would respect a country's sovereignty and recognize that there may be alternative means for reaching the objective of health and environmental protection. Rather than rigidly defining the term, it's preferable to allow for international dialogue on this issue, thereby leaving the U.S. open to better understand and respond to the ideas and specific requirements of other nations. In conclusion, I want to emphasize the importance of obtaining the needed legislative authority to ratify Basel as quickly as possible in order to continue the leadership role the United States has assumed in the international community. 
and to guarantee our place at future meetings of the parties of the Basel Convention. <coughs> in the meantime, we will continue to actively ensure compliance with our existing regulations and will continue our vigorous efforts to make continuous improvements with our existing, within our existing regulatory framework. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Train. Let's start here. Uh, does EPA know exactly how many maquiladora plants along the Mexican border there are? Well, we're, we're estimating that there are approximately 2,000, and there's been a, quite a bit of growth. In, Do you know in, exactly how many there are? No. Okay. I don't think Why the Mexican not? government knows exactly how many there are. So you, the ballpark figure is 2,000? That's the ballpark, yes. Does EPA have any idea how much hazardous waste is being generated? Um, we, we don't have a firm uh, fix on the amount of hazardous waste that, okay. that is being Why not? generated. Well, that information, of course, is um, uh, the, the hazardous waste that is generated is generated in Mexico, and uh, we're working to um, obtain that information with the Mexican authorities who are also interested in obtaining that information. All right. Do you know whether the waste uh, that should be returned to the United States is disposed of, in fact, coming back here? Excuse me? Do you know whether the waste <coughs> that should be returned to the United States for disposal is in fact coming back? We, we know that in, that in uh, some instances the waste is coming back and that in many instances it may not be. Okay. Is the uh, maquiladora hazardous waste uh, being illegally disposed of, Mr. Train? I, I don't have any direct knowledge of how it's being disposed of in Mexico, but I think that there is a high likelihood that it is being disposed of in violation of Mexico law in some cases. Now, Mr. Train, as you know, under the 83 Border Environmental Agreement, the United States is required to readmit for disposal all waste generated by uh, these industries which utilize U.S. Uh, raw materials. Would it be fair to say that one reason that the United States has agreed uh, to take back this waste is because of the exponential growth along the border that is expected and that uh, we're concerned that this waste is treated uh, correctly and properly? That's right. Would you also agree that improperly managed waste uh, which is generated by the maquiladoras can result in very high risk to health as well as environment? Yes. They're, they're in some instances they are um, producing hazardous waste that would be regulated strictly. And would you also plan. agree that the United States has a very keen interest in ensuring that uh, the maquiladora generated hazardous waste is managed and disposed of properly in accordance with that 83 Border Act? Yes, it does. Well, if you all at EPA don't know who's generating the waste, how much waste is being generated, and whether it's coming back here for disposal, how can we in the United States meet our obligations under the 83 Border Environmental Agreement? Well, I think that, um, of course, that that is going to require... Um, uh, we can't do lot, it, can we? A lot more that. cooperation with the Mexican government, and uh, uh, we are um, uh, going to uh, do a lot more in the way of, of tracking that waste, in the way of uh, integrating our data systems with the Mexican government's data systems, the Mexican government itself has, has said that it wants to um, catalog all of the, uh, the, the entire universe of, of maquiladoras. They, all want to, they want to identify those that are producing hazardous waste. The, the folks, the maquiladoras that are producing hazardous waste are required to register with the Mexican government. And if they want to export that waste, um, they would have to obtain the consent of the Mexican government. Now, we'll get to that later, but the question is, without that information I just went through, you can't meet your uh, requirements of the 83 uh, environmental agreement? Well, we, we would need further information. Okay. Now, GAO now, test... Now, I would point out, though, that um, we have agreed to admit the waste, and we are, in fact, meeting our obligation to admit the waste as it comes back. Okay. Now, you heard GAO testify earlier uh, that the SEDUI inspections of 120 maquiladoras conducted earlier this year revealed significant hazardous waste management problems including, and let me just repeat it, air and water admission violations, improper handling of hazardous waste, failure to export hazardous waste to the country of origin. In fact, GAO states that almost half of the maquiladoras inspected were partially or temporarily closed because of these types of violations. And Mr. Hembra, who you uh, uh, are following, testified that SEDUI does not believe Mexico has sufficient hazardous waste disposal capacity uh, to handle the generated on its own domestic industries, much less the ones coming out of the maquiladoras. Now, given all these stark realities, Mr. Train, 
why hasn't the EPA done more to ensure that these wastes are returned to our country of origin? Well, I, I think that the EPA has uh, done a, a lot of the things that it can do given the constraints that we're operating under, considering particularly that uh, this waste is being generated in a foreign country. Um, we uh, are <coughs> engaging in a, um, a strong effort with the Mexican government to uh, uh, obtain more information about that waste once again and to identify the, that universe and to bring that waste back. I think maybe Sylvia Lawrence may have a comment on that. Yes. <coughs> One of the main difficulties, given the unique status of the maquiladoras, is that uh, we and, the, and Mexico um, have a differing interpretation of the obligation to report back to the United States um, and subject those to the import notification requirements. Okay, so we're starting with two. We've got two problems that we need to solve. First is an identification. Um, that they are generators of hazardous waste. And the second is to clarify um, that uh, there is an obligation between our two governments to, to receive those notifications. We've undertaken a number of efforts already with Mexico, and we plan to do more under the new border agreement that's being finalized. Um, in, in the case of Mexico, um, we are developing a pilot project with them um, to link up their data systems um, with ours. Um, and that pilot's underway um, at this point in time with Region 6. Uh, the second step is to determine who is managing that waste. Uh, who, do we have reason to believe they are generating? You cited the Region 6 document that details the industries and the, we would expect to generate hazardous waste. We have shared that with Mexico. We've uh, embarked on a number of joint training efforts with Mexico and we have had them to our training courses for our domestic inspectors so that the Mexican government officials as they increase those resources can uh, uh, readily identify those that should be subject to notification and to the Mexican all right, let's talk about those new efforts that mm -hmm. you're planning to undertake. I ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record portions of EPA's August 1991 draft integrated environmental plan for the Mexican Mexico-U.S. Uh, border area. Now, pages 6 through 10, I'm sorry, 610 through 614, outline the implementation plan for transboundary shipments of hazardous waste. Now, the first goal is to assemble information on waste uh, generation rates of Mexican and U.S. facilities in those border areas. Now, GAO said earlier, uh, Mr. Train, that Mexico is having a hard time determining how many maquiladoras generate hazardous waste because most of them are not registered with SEDUI. Will EPA help SEDUI identify these facilities? And if so, how are you going to do it? Well, we will work with the Mexican government to the extent that they ask for our assistance to help them identify the types of industries that identify that, that produce hazardous waste. And um, uh, have they asked for our assistance, Mr. Trey? <coughs> I believe that um, that they have. I don't know for a fact. Okay, now I'd like to also ask unanimous consent to introduce portions of EPA's 1989 Maquiladora Generator Guide into the record at this time. <coughs> As I believe was mentioned earlier, EPA Region 6 published this guide uh, to assist with inspections of the Maquiladora facilities. As you can see from the example, the guide analyzes the steps in typical manufacturing processes and estimates, uh, estimates the types and amounts of uh, waste generated during production. Again, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Train, has EPA and SEDUI made any efforts to utilize this information to predict how much waste is being generated and should be shipped back to the country of origin? I, I don't know whether or not um, this document has been used. I believe it has been supplied to the Mexican government. The, the so document has been provided to the Mexican government, to the, at least to Dewey, I believe. Um, our EPA Region 6, as part of um, uh, trying to, to look at how we can predict what sh we should be seeing come across the border, has done some extrapolations. But I have to emphasize that extrapolation doesn't substitute for 
on-site visits that, that, that assure that we understand who is generating the waste and getting them into the Mexico system. Yeah, and I think that this Mexican government also has a recertification process whereby all of the maculadoras along the border region must register with the Mexican government. Do you remember uh, GAO testifying that less than a quarter of those companies are uh, registered with uh, uh, SEDUI? Yes, at, curr at current levels, the, obviously the, the um, registration program is lacking. I think that this is a new initiative of the Mexican government. So hanging your hat and, uh, on that doesn't help, does it? Well, I think that uh, they're, it, they've proven that they're very serious about this effort, I believe. I would also add that I believe uh, beginning today is the fourth annual conference um, jointly with SEDUI and uh, US, our, our U.S. folks are participating to educate the maquiladoras as to their responsibilities and where they may be managing waste. That's part of the recertification. None of us are doubting the sincerity of Mexico. What we're trying to do is make sure you all are helping them in any way. Who's going to be in charge of making this waste generation projections, Mr. Train? The waste generation projections in um, uh, with the maculadoras in, in Mexico? Yes. Uh, I suppose our office in coordination with the, with the Mexican government, Sedue. Okay, now the 1991 draft border environmental plan also calls for central binational computer tracking system. What's the timetable for implementing uh, that comprehensive tracking system? I think that the tracking system is hopefully going to be in place sometime in 93. Now, how will I that? I think that the the good the good thing about that tracking system is Mr. that. Mr. Train, oh, let, me, let me let uh, me ask you some specific things about that because I, I want to pin you down on this. Well, how will that system work logistically? Well, it's um. Uh, In other words, who's going to be responsible for implementing the system, setting and meeting the milestones, and getting the system up and running? Well, of course, that uh, effort would be coordinated between EPA and uh, the Mexican. Uh, environmental Ministry, Sedue. Um, we have a pilot project underway right now to do just that in Region 6, and we are um, uh, engaging in an implementation effort with that pilot project. I think that um, Mr. Train, we I need specifics. I mean, w the last three answers to our questions have been basically plans on plans on plans. Can you give us some specifics? Again, let me ask you. Who's going to be in charge of, uh, uh, of implementing, setting up, and meeting the milestones? and running the system? The, uh, um, I believe that the system will be operated by um, our waste management divisions in the regions in connection with uh, our national um, computer information center. Um, I think that the, uh, um, the border plan uh, uh, will require resources to be, to imp be fully implemented and uh, we are uh, currently getting our allocations of resources now and we'll be looking to see exactly how they'll be allocated to our, our border initiatives and um, uh, we are working currently on milestones for the implementation of the integrated data um, uh, plan. Are you going to ask for additional resources to uh, assist you in, in this effort? I think that, uh, um, well, Sylvia, could you address that? Um, we are just now in receipt of our 1992 budgets. One of the, I understand uh, on the border plan, one of the major comments that was received during the public review process um, was that we needed to have specific milestones and resource allocations to the commitments being made there. Since we now have our 92 resources, we're examining it. I can tell you that over the last few years, our trend in allocating our resources toward exports is, is, is upward, and I would expect it to continue to go upward given the responsibilities. It's All obviously right now, a high priority for us. GAO testified, as you heard them earlier, that only 24 joint training inspections had been done since 1989. That's not a lot over a three-year period. Do you all have any intention to join uh, SEDUI to continue to conduct these and increase the number of inspections? Well, I think it, it, it may not seem like a lot, but I think that in terms of the number ins of inspectors that there were in Mexico in 1989, it probably was a lot. Um, but, of course, that's going to be increasing, and that's part of the, uh, the border plan. As there are more inspectors added to the Mexican um, workforce, as I think um, uh, Mr. Klinger mentioned in his open, opening statement, that number of inspectors has increased dramatically and will continue, I think, to, to increase in accordance with the Mexican governments. What about information sharing? What steps have you all taken to make sure the information with Sedui and the Maquiladoras on source reduction and pollution prevention 
on making industrial processes more efficient? Well, we're very interested, of course, in, in uh, waste minimization and pollution prevention. I think that uh, you've, you've got to take into account the fact that the Mexican government has a very strong environmental statute, that they are beginning to enforce that statute with more alacrity and with more resources. Uh, we are um, engaging in, uh, in, in technology training and transfer, uh, educational type seminars, as, as Sylvia mentioned. There is uh, exactly that kind of seminar going on now with the Maculadoras um, uh, in Mexico. That's, by the way, the fourth annual um, uh, conference of that nature. And um, uh, uh, we will continue, of course, to, to provide them with as much information as, as we can with respect to that subject. The uh, draft border environmental plan uh, mentions poor coordination between the agencies as a problem that needs to be addressed. Do you agree with GAO's recommendation that EPA should formally arrange with the U.S. Customs Service to develop a waste tracking plan for waste crossing the borders and that EPA should ensure through cooperations with that Customs Service that manifest are complete and accurate? I think that, um, uh, by the way, our relationship with the Customs Service has been excellent, uh, particularly with respect to, to exports. We'd like more authority in the imports area. We have uh, recently met with the Customs Service, and uh, um, uh, planning additional uh, activities on imports is, is, of course, on the table at this time. What's your timetable? Um, I don't know exactly what the timetable is. Well, I want to commend Sooner rather than later. I want to commend uh, EPA's Region 6 in particular for their dedication in addressing these issues. Uh, it's no surprise that uh, Oklahoma is located in Region 6. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to emphasize that it's vital uh, to put some of the uh, meat and bones on these good ideas, Mr. Train. Uh, that means more specifics on who's responsible for implementing what, who's going to pay for the initiatives, and exactly what's going to be accomplished. And you can plan us to death and the problem will continue. Mr. Lippens. At least it's a start. Mr. Chairman, I only have one a question, and um, it really t attempts to follow up on one of the points that, that you made, um, and, and I c concur with your observation that uh, there, there does seem to be a lack of specificity in some of the answers. I understand the reasons for that is this is a developing uh, process. But on the question of the inspections, could you give a little bit better handle on exactly what you expect in terms of numbers prospectively as opposed to what has happened now as this number of inspectors is, increases? It, it's hard to tell. I, I think that the GAO um, uh, people who were here a minute ago mentioned that uh, Sedue so recently inspected 120 maculadoras, and that's a fairly significant percentage out of, the, say, 2,000 there, that there might be there. And they uh, shut down approximately uh, almost half of them for at least, uh, at least partially or for at least, or at least a temporary period of time while the uh, violations uh, were being addressed. Um, I think that uh, we would like to do more uh, in the way of, of joint um, activities on both sides of the border. And, uh, of course, it's a very sensitive issue, the dealing with sovereignty um, uh, uh, of, of foreign nations. And uh, so it's hard to predict with any specificity, sorry, that uh, the exact number of uh, inspections there will be in the future. I think that um, our, our customs um, uh, officers are becoming much more aware of the situation. And, and in fact, I think that uh, at the border point where a lot of the wastes are coming across from Mexico, Tijuana, San Diego. Um, the, the customs uh, office there is very active, under, undertaking sometimes spot checks of loads coming across the border for compliance with the manifest and that sort of thing. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Mr. Train, GAO testified that Mexico's environmental laws and regulations mirror those of the United States in most respects. For example, they said Mexico requires the tracking of hazardous waste from generation through disposal. You'd agree with that characterization, wouldn't you? I believe that's correct. I haven't undertaken my own review of the Mexican environmental laws. Would you also say that the passage of the uh, Mexico's 88 in general environmental law, that now Mexico has an adequate system in place for the management and disposal of hazardous waste? I, I believe that that's correct. Yes, again, right. I haven't now, referred, reviewed the law myself. You're aware... Mr. Train, the administration's legislative proposal to implement the Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste 
permits waste trade only in instances where the United States has a bilateral agreement with the receiving country and where the bilateral provides for the waste to be handled in, quote, an environmentally sound manner. You're, That's right. You're yeah. familiar with that. Now, it's my understanding the administration has not defined the term, quote, disposal in an environmentally sound manner, but is deciding whether the waste will be treated in an environmentally sound manner by a receiving country, that the United States uh, will take into consideration the adequacy of the receiving country's regulatory system to manage the disposed hazardous waste. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. Now, among other things, I've given heard. your statement just a moment ago that Mexico's laws and regulations are nearly identical to RICRA, is it your position that Mexico would provide a waste disposal in, quote, an environmentally sound manner? Well, I, I think capacity issues aside, that, uh, that, that that is the goal of the, of the uh, Mexican uh, legislation, yes. So GAO just outlined significant problems Mexico is having in terms of getting sufficient funding for inspectors for pollution and control. They're having problems having adequate enforcement resources. So let me ask you, how can you tell this subcommittee that the U.S. can assure that Mexican citizens are protected from our waste and that they're being handled in an environmentally sound manner? Uh, I think in th at this time, um, uh, Mexico, uh, we do not ship hazardous waste to Mexico except for recycling, and that is because our bilateral with Mexico, we have an agreement with Mexico whereby they will not take hazardous waste for treatment or disposal. Um, well, for the sake of argument, Mr. Train, let's say a free trade agreement with Mexico passed and that the waste disposal company started locating disposal facilities in Mexico and could receive U.S. waste. Would you consider exports to Mexico to be disposed of in an environmentally sound manner? Well, I think that that, that would be a hypothetically, uh, that's a hypothetical question I'd care not to speculate. I would uh, like to think that our waste management uh, companies would operate in compliance with Mexican law. Well, the point is, and all of this is mute, because we know that the administration bill exempts existing bilateral agreements from having to comply with the requirement to ensure that the waste are handled in an environmentally sound manner. And that's probably the biggest deficiency of the bill. Mr. Train, do the current bilaterals we have with Canada and Mexico I'm, require... I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that last statement? I, I didn't I hear I said that's probably the biggest so, deficiency of the what, bill. What is it? Sorry. The fact that you exempt existing bilaterals. Do you have current... Well, do I think the current that, uh, bilaterals, Mr. Train, that we have with Canada and Mexico require that the receiving facilities treat U.S. waste in an environmentally sound manner? I think that the, the, the fact is that they do. Uh, they do? Not, not the bilaterals, no. But okay, th I think then that they are not now in compliance with the requirements of the Basel Convention. Is that correct? Well, I believe that, that once the Basel Convention is ratified and we have implementing legislation, that our bilaterals will be on the table for discussion and improvement in accordance with the Basel Convention. <coughs> Or, let me ask you about that. Aren't those bilaterals self-renewing? Yes, but they can be amended at any time. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is exempting about 90% of the problem, and to catch that 90% of the problem will require amendments to self, uh, self-fulfilling prophecies that just can continue, right? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. <clears throat> let me, Mr. Train, what we're trying to say here is, is that the two countries that get most of our waste have bilateral agreements that are not covered by the Basel Convention. These agreements were entered into prior to the Basel Convention. I understand that. Right. I mean, we've, we're all on the same page here. The problem is, is that since they can uh, continue, uh, unless there's an amendment, we'll still have a, uh, a hole that you could drive a Mack truck through. It's always been our intention to um, uh, uh, make those bilaterals consistent with the, um, 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 uh, with the Basel Convention. Mr. Seiner, if I may, if I may add, um, the intent of our legislation um, was only to allow those bilaterals to remain in effect while we're renegotiating and promulgating new rules pursuant to, to new legislation. Under Basel, we feel we have to change the bilaterals because they do not address the, 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 some of the new mutual obligations that we'll have between the parties under the convention. During that time period, I believe the administration bill also has some additional conditions that must be met for that interim period. 
Can I get you to commit on the record, Ms. Lawrence, that you will do that as expeditiously as possible after the Basel Convention is ratified? Um, we will do it as expeditiously as possible, considering the need for new legislative authorities when we get those and the rules <laughs> pursuant to those. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, and the way again, to solve that bill is to pass the signer ropey bill. And <laughs> we I guess we be, have a difference uh, of opinion on good that. shape. Let me uh, ask you one more set of questions about your bill. As I mentioned earlier, the administration's bill does not define disposal as, quote, an environmentally sound manner. Rather, the president is asking us here in Congress to trust EPA and OMB to come up with an acceptable definition through rulemaking some 18 months after enactment. Is that correct? Yes. All right, now I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record a copy of two draft decisions prepared by the Preparatory Committee for the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development scheduled to play, take place in Rio next summer. All right, now these documents set forth the, uh, the prep comments, statements of principles with respect to international waste management and trade and the handling of radioactive waste. <clears throat> now, among other things, the U.S. opposed establishing specific quantitative targets for pollution prevention or waste minimization, Mr. Train. The U.S. also objected to the entire text devoted to management of radioactive waste, including a proposal to promote measures to prevent and minimize generation of radioactive waste, a proposal to ban the disposal of radioactive waste at sea, and even a proposal to negotiate a legally binding international instrument on radioactive waste based on the International Atomic Energy Agency's Code of Practice on Transboundary Movement of Radioactive Waste. Mr. Train, these don't seem like excessive proposals uh, to this subcommittee, yet the administration has rejected them out of hand before we even get to Rio next year. Now, if the administration will not, Mr. Train, if the administration will not commit to addressing these issues globally, why should we in Congress trust you with the tough decisions on what constitutes environmentally sound management? Well, I don't think that um, uh, these discussions are the uh, form in which the definition of environmentally sound management under Basel is being uh, discussed. And those uh, discussions are taking place in, in the context of the UNEP um, discussions on environmentally sound management. But doesn't that kind of set the character and tone of confidence we should or should not have in you all? Um, <laughs> Want to address that? <laughs> I mean, this is pretty um, discouraging. This is pretty. I'm not. I'm simple, just not personally familiar with this stuff, Ms. Laurent. I think we're on the record, um, uh, having said that in determining what's environmentally sound, we believe it, ne it means protection of human health and the environment. Um, the preliminary working group discussions that have been had in the United Nations Environment Program are looking at a whole series of options from a no less stringent standard. What's supported that definition again? What? What's that? Pardon? More Did you just say more stringent? I said that under the United Nations Environment Program Working Group, they are looking at a series of options um, in a working session to come up with for the first meeting of the parties. They are looking at everything from no less strict to an environmentally sound standard to some presumptive technology standards. And I think one of our major concerns as we move into this process is to have the ability when those negotiations start um, to negotiate amongst the options that, that all, the country, all the party countries will be laying on the table. And as you're aware, we're not sure a no less strict standard will allow us to do that. Mr. Lukens, any uh, question? You, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Train, let's discuss the Lilliblad waste ex import case that GAO mentioned earlier. <clears throat> well, let me recap it for you, okay? Lilliblad Petroleum of Tacoma, Washington imported 5,500 gallons of liquid flammable waste from A.A. A. Anderson Company of British Columbia. Little Blad did not test the waste. Instead, it shipped it to Continental Cement Company for use as a fuel on a cement keel. Upon shipment of the waste to Continental, the manifest named Lily Blad as the generator. <clears throat> In other words, the true generator of the waste, the Canadian generator, was not even listed on the manifest. Now, isn't it a requirement that the true generator in this case, a foreign generator, be listed on those shipping documents, Mr. Train? 
Yeah, I believe it is at, at the at, at the original point of entry. Yeah. Then why is Lily Blad listed as the generator of the waste well, on the manifest going to Continental Cement? I think in accordance with our our import provisions that um, uh, the importer of the waste can identify himself as generator. Is that correct, Ms. Lawrence? That's that's correct. The way the the way the system works is under the manifest requirements. It's the generator of the waste, and at the point of entry, you must identify the originator, uh, the foreign originator of the waste. Um, in addition, an importer under our import regulations, okay, must has a one-time notification requirement if they're an importer of of the waste. Okay. Now, GAO testified that. A waste broker arranged for that shipment of waste from Lilliblad to Continental. Mr. Train, how are uh, these waste brokers regulated by EPA? Do they have to register with you all, or do they have to have some prior experience uh, on these types of waste shipments uh, in order to arrange these well, transactions? It, it, it depends on on what their relationship is to to the waste, but um, it, brokers don't have a specific um, uh, category under RICRA. They're either handlers, transporters people arranging for disposal, that sort of thing, and, and, and they would generally fall within the ambit of RICRA under one of those categories. So there's no really specific regulations on the broker, right? Well, it, 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 they are regulated in just about, every, I say, virtually every instance. How are they regulated? Well, they are either a handler or a disposer or a treater. But they or have something. to hold the material to become that. No, I don't think so. I think as long as that they have the chain of custody that, that they are... Um, They're brokers. They don't have a custody. Well, unless they, they do. Take they take custody. They, yeah, I think that since they are the generator, um, when it comes in, um, they they in fact do have obligations under RICRA. Mr. Steiner, I, I, we may have a factual um, issue here, and I apologize because we, um, until yesterday, didn't uh, understand this was going to be the subject of the hearing. So we don't have all the cases on on Lily Blatt itself. Um, the uh, I, I will ask: Is your question? Are, if, is, the is the fact as you understand yeah. it that, the that there was a separate take, broker from Lily Blatt or that Lily Blatt was the broker? Now, let's, let's go in generics. If the broker doesn't take possession of the shipment but arranges the waste shipment, what status are they in then? If, if the broker never handles the waste, they would not become a, a handler under the RICRA or statute. Or considered a generator for liability purposes. Not unless they have a relationship to the waste that would make them a, a, a handler under the RICRA law. Okay, so when Continental Cement received the waste shipment, it tested the comments, contents, and it found DDT, DDE, Chlordane, which were unacceptable for, for their cement kills. And according to GAO, those shipments were listed on the Hazardous Waste Manifest. Now, Continental rejected the shipment. Now, Mr. Train, did EPA penalize Lily Blad for misrepresenting what was actually in the shipment of those manifest documents? Well, I, I believe that uh, this shipment took place in Washington State. And Washington State's an authorized state under, under RICRA, and they, I believe, are taking their own enforcement actions. All right. Do you require generators to list the contents of a shipment by hazardous waste code? Uh, no, we don't require that the manifest itself, that's not the purpose of the manifest, um, contain the, the ship. The uh, sorry, the hazardous waste code. Um, the any any waste that is subject to the land disposal restrictions, though, must um, the generator of that waste must provide the TSD with um, a, an adequate description of the waste, probably including waste codes, and um, uh, also the preferred treatment of uh, uh, and disposal of that waste. Why don't you require it? Well, the purpose of the manifest serves a different function. That's a tracking function. Um, rather than an actual um, uh, treatment. But for uh, emergency typhoon. personnel who might have to deal with an accident or spill, that might be pretty important to see that on the manifest. And it's, it's my understanding that the, that the manifest will have um, DOT um, uh, hazardous uh, uh, characteristics. So in other words, if it's ignitable, the types of things that you need to be concerned about as a first responder to an instance, in addition to which there may be additional documentation that the Department of Transportation requires. So well, how can we be sure that DOT is uh, adequately warning how to handle this? Well, are you got an MOU with them? I believe we do have an MOU, and uh, uh, there is a DOT requirement that uh, shipping document uh, con contain that information. Um, and I believe that the responsible office, of the Department of Transportation, is is RISPA, um, and the Office of uh, Hazardous Materials Transportation. All right, let's move on here. According to the GAO, after the Continental Cement rejected the shipment, Lily Blad then instructed the broker to send the waste to Marine Shell processors in Morgan City, Louisiana. Now, Marine Shell tested the waste and found excessive levels of uh, 
halogenated solvents and also rejected the shipment. Next, the waste shipment was sent to GSX Recovery in Crowley, Louisiana, where it again was tested and again rejected. And finally, it was sent to Rollins Environmental Services in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where it was ultimately disposed of. Now, explain for me, Mr. Train, how this thing works. When we export waste, we have to tell EPA where it is going and what we have to get, and we have to get the receiving country's approval prior to shipping that waste. But in this situation, where the United States is the import of the waste, it's being bounced around this country like a pinball. Now, don't we have any kind of requirement that imported waste be shipped to a facility in which it's listed on the manifest, and if it's rejected by that facility, that it goes back to the exporting country? No, it, it, it may go to a secondary um, uh, TSD listed on the manifest. At that point, if that, if that um, uh, uh, TSD rejects the, if the second TSD rejects the, the shipment, then it must be referred back to the generator for further direction. Why not? Uh, why, don't, why don't we have that requirement? Because every time this thing's bouncing around like a pinball, it increases the chance of accident, increases the chance of uh, an emergency spill, and, and it doesn't seem like there's any safeguards built in here. This thing could bounce around the country in four or five, six states before uh, it's disposed of. Well, it obviously would be preferable that it reached a, um, a, 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 a permitted TSD uh, on the first trip, on the first instance. Um, we do have the authority to return the waste um, if, if uh, something is going wrong. Um, in this case, the manifest tracking system seemed to work, and in fact, the waste wound up in a, in a permanent TSD that was um, able to handle it. Well, the shoe's on the other foot, because the last time we sat down with you all, we were talking about the uh, key and C and how that waste was bouncing around the world, leaving this country. Now. The waste is in our country and it's bouncing around in our country. Uh, I guess the, the problem we're having here is that we don't see anything's changed since the last time we sat down with you all to try to work this thing out, except the fact that it's now going on in our own backyard versus around the world on a barge. Uh, what thing is that? Sorry. That is waste bouncing around here trying to find a home with very little EPA supervision. Well, I, I, would, I would dispute that. I think that, the, as I said before, that the manifest system was working, that the waste was tracked properly. It was unfortunate how it entered the country in the way it did. Um, once it did, RIC were operated as well as could be expected under the circumstances, and that the waste reached a treatment storage and disposal facility that was uh, permitted for that type of waste. Well, does the U.S. receive notification when a foreign country other than Canada or Mexico ships its hazardous waste here for disposal? <coughs> Um, we, we need further uh, statutory authority under um, Basel. Uh, so to, the answer is no. Yes. All right. I'd like to call to your attention to a notation on that July 19th, 90 uh, discrepancy report contained in the exhibit introduced earlier on the Lilliblatt shipment. It reads, and let me quote it, Section 1, waste numbers U036 and U061 need to be removed, unquote. Now, those waste codes are the waste codes added onto the manifest by Continental Seaman after it was tested, Mr. Train. The notation at the bottom of that page, have, we, have you found it yet? No. <clears throat> how, how many pages in is it? And we might be able to follow it that way. It's on page... Uh, oh, about... Looks like this. It says discrepancy report at the top. You got it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Read that notation. It says uh, section one waste numbers U U036 and U061 need to be removed. Now those were added onto the manifest by Continental Seaman after they tested the shipment. Now the notation at the bottom of the page indicates that the broker authorized that deletion. Is that acceptable, Mr. Train? I don't, I don't know how the manifest system works in that detail. Again, I'd like to refer that question to. Mr. Hale, is that acceptable? The, the, under our regulations, this discrepancy report is required where people um, find that, where someone receiving a waste finds a situation where the shipment does not comport with the, sh with the documents that are accompanying the waste. And they are required 
to fill out this document under the rules to identify that discrepancy that uh, usually is identified as a result of their waste analysis plan requirements um, under, the, under the rules as well. Um, in this particular case, it is acceptable if it is accurate. If it is not, it is enforceable against the signature and submitter of the discrepancy report. It's my understanding. Did you all take any action there, Ms. Lawrence? Um, I do not know in this particular case. We'll have to get back to you. We know that this chain started with an illegal event, and the manifest system is allowing us to track back. Well, let me, let me, let's cut to the, the chase here. Can you explain to me how the Rollins Corporation was able to burn that waste that Marine Shell and GSX rejected? Uh, uh, we, I we, believe it's in their permit, is it? We would have to examine their permit to to be certain that uh, they could burn all these wastes. Um, Can I've you had get back no with us on that? Pardon? Can you get back with we, us on that? We'd be glad to get back sure. to you on that. Um, GAO mentioned, Mr. Train, that the United States was importing waste that was technically not ours. Uh, Mr. Hember, I think... Technically not what, sorry? Ours. It's not ours in our country. He mentioned the Tijuana recycling facility, I think, uh, as the example. What do you mean, not maculadora waste? Exactly. Oh, I see, yeah. All right. He also mentioned U.S., German, and, and Japanese maculadora situations. Is the U.S. receiving advance notice from Mexico about these shipments? Um, I don't know for a fact. I haven't heard uh, they are required to do so, I believe. non maculadora waste would, 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 under our bilateral, require notice and consent. Could you find out for us? Yes, we'll look at the report. Into that. Thank you. Mr. Train, when the Maquiladora generated hazardous waste are shipped back to the United States for disposal, is that waste generally returned to facilities in the state or the parent company, or is the waste sent to a treatment or storage disposal facility closest to the border? It would be sent probably to the waste uh, treatment disposal facility that was um, uh, closest and best suited to handling that waste. We don't naturally have, um, every state does not have every kind of waste treatment facility that would be required to deal with these wastes. All right, I'd like to ask unanimous consent at this point to introduce in the record a page from a draft report on EPA Region 6, um, Maquiladora's database. <coughs> Now, Mr. Train, as you can see from this chart, 91% of the waste entering the United States through Region 6 states' borders is shipped to treatment, storage, and disposal facilities within Region 6. Now, I have to tell you that I'm very concerned about that. On the one hand, I understand that we want to make sure and ensure that the border is protected, and to do that, we want to get the Maquiladora-generated waste back to where it can be properly disposed of. Well, on the other hand, Mr. Train, I'm from Oklahoma, and I know that much of that waste may be disposed of in my state, rather than the state where the parent company is located. I personally believe that the United States should honor its moral obligation uh, to ensure that the waste is returned to the United States. But I also believe that the parent companies that are located here in this country that reap the benefits from the Maquiladora industry also have a moral responsibility, too. Now, Mr. Train, what am I going to tell the citizens of Oklahoma when they ask me if we're becoming a dumping ground for waste from United States companies located in Mexico as well as our domestic companies? Well, I think that you obviously need to tell them the truth. and uh, that I try to do that every day. <laughs> and that uh, that is the way our system works. We want to ensure that wastes, wherever they're generated, are treated and disposed of in an environmentally sound manner in this country in accordance with RICRA. And uh, uh, we also want to make sure that that's done as efficiently as possible. Um, I think in more or less in principle, we're opposed to artificial limitations on where waste has to go because we believe that will lead to capacity imbalances, higher costs, and perhaps less environmentally sound management of the waste. And it will impact uh, Region 6 states' capacity assurance plans, will it not? Um, I'm, yes. Okay. Mr. Train, one key problem identified in the subcommittee's 88 hearing was the fact that uh, you all at EPA could not offer advice uh, to receiving countries when the agency had reason to believe that an export proposal was suspect. What has EPA done to address that problem? Well, I, I think that um, we have uh, improved, obviously, our ability to transmit the information to the country um, receiving the waste that would be necessary to evaluate 
what kind of waste uh, uh, is being shipped and what the preferred treatment methods were for that, that kind of waste. What specifically have you done, Mr. Train? Well, um, we have um, uh, beefed up our, um, uh, our ability to review um, uh, the, that information. We have uh, consolidated within EPA um, our tracking um, systems from the Office of International Activities to our Office of Waste Program Enforcement so that we have a, um, a better connection there. Uh, we, of course, have our memorandum of understanding with the um, uh, customs, uh, U.S. Customs, that, uh, where they provide us with the manifest. They do spot checks on occasion to see that the waste uh, being shipped comports with the, um, uh, the, 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 the shipping specifications. Uh, we have training, um, regular training exercises with uh, the, the customs um, folks. And uh, uh, in general, uh, we've done quite a bit. Um, since the last time. But is it not the, still the position of EPA uh, not to stop shipments even if they know they will not be handled properly? It's um, not within our authority to stop and the administration's bill, H.R. 2398, would provide us with that authority. Mr. Tran, what is the current law to prevent, uh, what is in the current law uh, to prevent EPA from providing the importing country with explicit information on the adequacy of the export proposal? I'm sorry, I don't get the question you're asking me. What, what prevents what, us yeah, from providing them with information? In the current law? Well, nothing. We provide them with the information. You're not, you are provide, you're, you're, you're willing to say under oath on the record that you're providing receiving countries this type of information. Which type of information? Which, which type of information? The information with respect to uh, the export proposal and whether or not the, uh, it's suspect or not. Well, I, I don't see. We, we don't, um, make a determination as to the adequacy of the information provided. We simply provide the information. That, um, again, the, the, the information that is required, let me, let me, let me clarify there. that. Yeah. Let me clarify. Help me here. The information that is, is required by the, by the um, export manifest is a description of the waste, where it is to be exported to, who is to handle it, and how it's to be handled. Um, Mr. Train, illegal exports of hazardous, hazardous waste to countries that clearly can't handle the waste are still taking place. Last July, an illegal waste export scheme where waste were being shipped to Pakistan was uncovered. I think you're aware in Los Angeles following an accident near the pier where the waste was shipped. Tell us, uh, if you could, how EPA is uh, trying to detect and address these illegal situations. Well, again, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of, with the Customs Agency, and uh, uh, they do spot checks, and they inform us when they find discrepancies. Um, sometimes we work closely with, with them at the border. Um, we're doing a variety of things, I think, that uh, will help us identify illegal exports of, of waste. Do you think we should ban the total export of hazardous waste out of this country? No, I don't think so. Another real problem identified in our 88 subcommittee report, Mr. Train, was the fact that the United States does not keep track of exports of so-called non-hazardous uh, waste. The non-hazardous waste can include materials like that municipal incinerator ash that we talked about on that boat. Can you tell us what EPA has done to address this problem of these so-called non-hazardous waste to ensure these kinds of materials are disposed of in an acceptable manner. Once again, we'd like the enabling legislation proposed by the administration in order to give us the authority to address non-hazardous waste. Whatever happened that uh, the the boat, the Key and C, at the hearing it was missing, <coughs> it was still somewhere out at sea trying to find a place. Whatever happened to that? Well, thing? we think it turned up in Singapore eventually. Although um, it's our information at that time, it was empty. And I'd like to, uh, uh, again, uh, suggest that this would emphasize the need for our implementing legislation for the Basel Convention. That's a nice answer, Mr. Train. Uh, is it pretty well safe to assume that that was probably uh, improperly disposed of? I have no idea how it was disposed. Mr. Train, last year, Bill Moyers and the Center for Investigative Reporter ran a documentary called Global Dumping Ground. Now, one riveting export case illustrated in that documentary was an exporter named Joe Chen, who exports scrap metal and used lead acid batteries to Taiwan and China. Now, in one scene, Mr. Chen proudly gestures to an open ravine where the stream runs and proclaimed that he had found the perfect spot for dumping waste from his scrap recycling operation in China. Now, I understand from the producers of the documentary that EPA was looking into Mr. Chen's case 
Has uh, EPA taken any enforcement action against Mr. Chin's operation? I'm not aware that they've taken any enforcement action against Why Mr. Not? Chin. Um, I'm not sure, but I believe that uh, um, Mr. Chin is not exporting hazardous waste. Um, I think that uh, there are hazardous byproducts from the recycling process. What's he exporting, think, Mr. Trey? Um, <coughs> Mr. Hill, can answer that? Yes, um, Region 9 has looked into this specific case, has interviewed Mr. Chen, has inspected uh, some of his uh, drums that were being sent to China, has interviewed scrap metal, uh, interviewed scrap metal yards where he's getting his waste from for exporting. Uh, up to this point, we understand from the region that they have found no violations and no hazardous waste being shipped. Uh, but doesn't it beg the question that we need to probably cover non-hazardous waste too? I, I think mm -hmm. we would like to. How important is that waste trade legislation uh, being passed quickly? How important is it to be, that it be passed quickly? Yes. It's extremely important that it be passed quickly. Um, the, the, uh, we, we believe that, well, right now I think about 13 parties have ratified. Once 20 parties have ratified, and the EC, of course, could, could meet that number once they ratify, and there are other countries that we've heard that are, that are on the verge of ratifying, then the Basel Convention goes into effect 90 days after uh, the 20th country ratifies. I agree with you, Mr. Train. Why did it take uh, you all until May to introduce and submit a proposal down here? Um, I don't know. The, uh, the are you not in charge? A, no, I, I started this job on April 29th. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so Laurence, you were here three that years ago. That was my predecessor, yeah. <laughs> Ms. Laurence, you were here three years ago. Why so long if you all are so anxious to get it done? Um, there were a number of issues that needed to be worked through the administration, um, and uh, we had a number of uh, issues that we needed to work through with regard to the Basel convention and its interpretation. Ms. Lawrence, you were aware just the other day, uh, Mr. Swift over at my Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Bacchus had an intent of leaking the passage of that legislation of Basel II RICRA. You know, if the President would offer assistance on passing the RICRA legislation, we could get this Basel implemented more quickly. Do you all have any plans to work with Congress on this RICRA legislation, Mr. Train? I, I believe that the, the administrator ha has committed to offer technical assistance to the committees that are technical developing this. Technical assistance? Uh, yes. Is that working I, with us to get it passed? Uh, I don't believe the administration ha uh, supports the RICRA bill. Mr. Train, under the administration's legislative proposal to implement the Basel Convention, waste exports are banned except where the United States has entered a bilateral agreement. What steps will the importing country have to take to enter into an international agreement with the United States? Well, of course, the, the diplomatic authorities would have to meet to discuss what the parameters of the bilateral would be. And uh, then uh, we would want, of course, to... to it's a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, it would be a case-by-case -case analysis. And uh, we would like to have access to that country to review their laws and to review their waste management facilities and practices to determine whether or not they have a prevention, monitoring, and response program that we would deem to be adequate under uh, our standards. So there's a strong likelihood these countries are going to be dealt differently depending on political, environmental, and economic types of things. It's kind of insulting, is it not, Mr. Train, to the sovereignty of these nations that they have to state up front what requirements they'll be willing to make uh, in order to get our waste? Well, I think that uh, they've already agreed to waive that insult by signing the Basel Convention. Does the Basel Convention apply to the United States exports of hazardous waste to Canada and Mexico? Um, the Basel Convention would apply to hazardous waste exports. Um, to Canada to can and Mexico. To Canada and Mexico. No. Is that right, Ms. Lawrence? The, the obligations under Basel, is my understanding, the obligations under Basel attach to all parties. So as long as we are parties, there's an obligation under that. The agreement does allow um, subordinate agreements that are consistent with Basel. To, to, to allow shipments between parties. And you've given parties. me a commitment on the record under oath that you're going to renegotiate these agreements just as quickly as that convention is signed, right? Con contingent on the conditions that I laid out, yes, sir. <laughs> I would point out that if, um, if, for example, Canada doesn't uh, ratify Basel and the United States does or vice versa, that waste trade between those two countries would end. Okay. Now, Article 4, Section 10 of Excellent. the convention states that it is the responsibility of the exporting country that the waste be treated in an environmentally sound manner by the importing country, and that, quote, under no circumstances, unquote, can the determination be left to the receiving country. 
How does the administration propose that the United States fulfill that responsibility under Basel, Ms. Mr. Train? Well, once again, as, as I mentioned earlier, we would be reviewing the waste management uh, uh, mechanisms within the countries uh, uh, that we're importing the waste um, for um, uh, to determine whether or not you're taking they had their word for it. Is that the way to summarize that? Well, no. I think that we have a lot of professionals in EPA that would be quite capable of making that kind of determination uh, should it be necessary. I, I must add that we're not contemplating and entering into any new bilaterals. Would you, would you agree that the legislation <coughs> that we've introduced with Mr. Wolpe would satisfy that condition under Article 4, Section 10, the inspections? The, ins the inspections provision? Yes. Wouldn't that satisfy that? I, I, I'm not sure that it would. I'm not sure, frankly, that we would be permitted by um, foreign countries but to But if they were inspection. permitted, wouldn't it meet those conditions? What do you think? I, I, frankly, I don't think an inspection alone meets is, is the only factor that would meet those conditions. If one goes and inspects a facility, as we found under our domestic program, uh, one can find uh, six months later to a year that there's a major compliance problem, a successor owner or whatever. The key, we think, is the integrity of the program in the, in the importing country. But and if you can make that technical determination, you've got people down there doing that, then it seems natural you can make the, the natural jump that the inspection could be done, too. You've got technical people down there that could do that, too. Well, but there's nothing to say that the importing country doesn't have highly competent inspectors under its domestic program. And I think there's some sensitivity on the part of several countries um, in uh, uh, another nation coming in um, with a different set of That's standards. That's Canada and Mexico you're referring to, is it not? The sensitivity, those nations I, here? I think in, in international discussions I've had and we had on Basel, there's more than, there's a lot of sensitivity uh, among nations with regard to that. Yeah, one any, one final question. Does the administration's bill contain reporting requirements for amounts and types of hazardous and non-hazardous waste exported from the U.S. to foreign nations? It, it, it does for hazardous waste. It what? It, it does for hazardous waste. But not for non-hazardous. For, for all covered wastes under Basel. <coughs> well, let me uh, municipal and municipal ash. <clears throat> let me close by making a couple of remarks before we conclude. Mr. Train and Ms. Lawrence, this is not a new problem. Uh, Ms. Lawrence, you sat uh, before me three years ago to discuss EPA's inadequate system to regulate this waste trade. <laughs> At that time, we all predicted the legislation would be forthcoming that year. Well, it took you almost three years to come up with the legislation, and quite frankly, your legislation, I think, leaves much to chance. It does not define disposal in, quote, an environmentally sound manner. It does not spell out how receiving countries would go about entering into a bilateral agreement with the United States. And perhaps most importantly, it provides exemptions for the two countries that get 90 percent of our waste. Now, the goal is simple. That is to ensure that the United States waste is treated safely wherever it is disposed of and to make sure that the United States waste is disposed of in foreign nations, that their citizens are afforded the same degree of protection that we give our own citizens. Now, I think that can be achieved, but I think uh, EPA is going to have to help us achieve that. Now, with respect to the United States' commitment to ensure that the waste from Mexico, Maquiladoras, is returned to this country and disposed of properly, I think it's clear that the United States is not living up to its promise. EPA has got to do more, I think, based upon what we've learned today from GAO, to help Mexico get a handle on this situation in order to protect the human health and environment on both sides of the border, both for Americans and Mexican citizens. That means setting goals, it means committing resources, and it means getting specific about what we're going to do. It also means that we have to implement safeguards uh, in order to ensure better tracking of waste coming into the United States for, from these foreign countries. Better coordination, obviously, is going to be critical with customs, as well as the other states that are in charge of their own programs, as well as the officials, and certainly, as we've learned from one example in Canada, that, that needs improvement. I'm going to tell you the same thing Mr. Swift told you. <clears throat> we want to work with you all on this. But we've been carrying this gauntlet for three years by ourselves, and uh, we really think that if you all would join with us, uh, we could get this done more quickly. 
We appreciate you all being here again this morning. Uh, this is uh, obviously a, a keen interest of this subcommittee and a number of members of Congress, and we look forward to having a resolution to this issue in this session of Congress. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I think we have uh, common goals, and uh, we look forward to working with your committee on the issue of waste exports. We have this C-SPAN 2 program reminder that the presidential inaugural of Bill Clinton is scheduled for Wednesday, January 20th at the U.S. Capitol. And of course, the C-SPAN networks will be there to bring you live coverage of that event. Now, coming up next here on C-SPAN 2, a discussion concerning some of those inaugural plans. More than a decade, C-SPAN.